All right. Well, all right. Welcome to the restaurant again with, uh, you know, Gary Hashman and Butch Hiles. And today our, our special guest is Ashley Lockwood from Ground Zero of Huntington, but also Ground Zero really across the country more or less now, right? I've seen you guys got people in Colorado and especially people <laughs> I know, but it seems like is Pittsburgh another place too or no? Yeah. Yeah. How about Georgia? Pittsburgh, Georgia, Pittsburgh, yeah. maybe North Carolina. Wow. That's pretty nice, huh? That's not too bad. So also what, speaking of that, so what is, uh, is Cam, I know Cameron's kind of helping with, uh, uh, with Matt there at Mortal. Um, so they're not right. really a ground zero thing, but I mean, that's really a stent extension of you guys anyway, more or less. I mean, we got Cameron and Jimmy, Jimmy Lobo. Yeah. Out there yeah. Who are, so did Jimmy officially move down there? I, he's been down there uh, with Cameron. It's hard to separate those two actually. Yeah, I noticed that, that they're really good friends, which is awesome. Um, and they have been the best training partners for one another. It's it's like the dynamic duo with those two. They really do bring out the best in one another. And anytime they're separated, things don't always go as well for them. But they, really? they work very well together, for sure. Well, I noticed that, too. Like, Jimmy used to work at the the Peddler down, down uh, by your gym, right? Like, the little... Um, food and beer place right and so i would see those yeah. guys mm -hmm. every time that i was there for work or or whatever but uh but anyway so any, let's talk about some couple quick things so for people that don't know actually we just that was a quick kind of introduction but um it's kind of funny because i was telling um gary for the quick story but what a legend that you were um not long ago and he was unaware because <laughs> he's from ohio <laughs> So this, I, this is good. I, I very legendary. <laughs> yeah. So that, that that but that's cool. That that'll kind of bring us into a couple of things here real quick. Is in in why yeah. I said that. Um, Ashley and his team, and you can kind of give the 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 background, but they essentially are one of the people, if not the people, that started jujitsu in West Virginia. One of the first teams that kind of really put things together. Um, and at that time, I don't know, were you guys still in, were you somewhere different? Because I, I know when I interacted with some guys, and I don't know if it's Phil or not, but they were in Morgantown. I remember meeting somebody in Morgantown or Clarksburg to get some mats when we started our gym. Um, so anyway, give us that kind of quick background, if you don't mind. Well, my jujitsu journey started in about 1994. Uh, the UFC was still in its infancy and a friend of mine introduced me to it and was like, Hey, you got to check out this hoist Gracie guy. You know, he's this 175 pound kid and he is just whipping everybody in the whole lineup, including these muscle bound wrestlers, boxers, he's beating all these, uh, seasoned martial artists. And of course, back at that time, it was style versus style and, no one had even heard of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And after watching uh, Hoist, uh, I decided, I don't know what this Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu stuff is, but that works and I'm gonna learn it. And uh, me and a, a few buddies uh, here in, in Barbersville, I uh, just basically started training on tarps. We rolled tarps out in the grass and started training as best we could with just tarps there wasn't there wasn't any instructors anywhere there wasn't any uh, schools anywhere uh, we basically had to watch ufc's and do what hoist did and we drilled whatever the hell hoist did and uh, sometimes we get moves in magazines of all ridiculous things you know that how they're broken down in little segments and you really don't know how you got from panel b to panel c but somehow you did and you just kind of improvise your way through it it wasn't the best clearly but it's what we had at the time and we then got the gracie basic set which was uh that was a at the time that was the uh the bible of jiu-jitsu so we just drilled everything in the basics the gracie um, the gracie basic set was that the horion video or it was it the yes. video set okay yeah it was it was horion and hoist 
and uh, look back on it. They're very young people at that time. And anyway, it was, it, it was a good, you know, a good intro, but it only goes so far, you know, after you drill it and drill it and drill it and drill it, uh, literally hundreds of times on each side, uh, after a while, you're kind of starving for something more. And there really wasn't anything. Uh, but we just improvised. And I think at that time, the uh, maybe the Gracie Intermediate Tape Series came out and on VHS. This was long, long before there was any of that DVD stuff. So uh, we got a bootleg copy of some Gracie Intermediates and drilled on that too. But it all took place on a just a mat in the grass in around 94. Uh, then I, of course, there's st we just trained one or two days a week uh, doing that. And then I left for law school and went to Morgantown. And then around 96, uh, I was up in Morgantown trying to find some place to train in Morgantown. And there really wasn't, you know, of course, there's no jujitsu schools anywhere uh, in 96, uh, at least locally. But I did manage to find a kung fu school that had a guy that was teaching at that time. And he knew slightly more than we did. Uh, I just, the only thing I knew was that he knew a, a little bit more but not a whole lot more than what i did at the time for some time perspective 1996 this is two years after the first ufc and that's because the first ufc was november of 94 i think uh probably it's something like that so we're we're talking only we're probably ufc age it's only ufc maybe three three maybe three yeah years. So and this, let me, let me take this back. This guy had the intermediate series. Now it's, it's kind of coming back to me now. This guy that we were training with had the intermediate series and that's why he knew more than we did at the time. And so anyway, we would end up drilling with uh, th this fella up in Morgantown and it, I was, it, there was four uh, of us that trained primarily with this guy heavily and it was uh, Neil Hurl, uh, Brian Dusenberry, and John Oliverio and I. And we just drilled and drilled and drilled until it would. And, and at that time, we were sneaking off and we found seminars in Columbus. We'd find, find a Helsin seminar. And we had started working in with Lloyd Irvin, uh, who was. Uh, in the Washington DC area. So I started training with uh, Lloyd or traveling to his school to, I would travel up there on some weekends and you know sleep in a car and just work out at his school for a weekend and then come back and maybe do that once a month or so. And, um, and then the four of us decided, hey, you know, the, the, at that time, the guy with the intermediate series, we had outpaced him, and he he knew it, and we knew it, and he just kind of stepped aside and let us sort of take over. And I I primarily, because uh, I, I was the oldest of the four, I guess you could say I kind of, uh, I don't want to say I led the thing, but I was more mature than the other guys. And I don't mean that in an immaturity sort of way. Kind, kind of a de facto we, leader. We decided to start a club. That, I guess you could call it de facto. Uh, well, that's, I think it, all of us have a similar story. I, you know, and Gary's asked me the same question before, and it was like, I don't, I think it sounds similar to you. Like, I didn't lead out to start a gym, right? I, I don't, you know, obviously you didn't either. I was never like, hey, I'm going to be a martial arts right. instructor, jujitsu instructor. It just kind of fell on like, it sounds just like you know, like I wanted to train and there's nowhere to train and then like we were training in my basement right so it kind of made me the same thing like a de facto leader because <laughs> like I had the basement and then we're like we outgrew the basement so then we're like 
let's start a gym just like you right but and we all chipped in it wasn't like hey this is butcher's gym or ashley's gym or gary's gym it just like eventually somebody has to step up and collect the money and make sure people are paying and like you know what i mean and then it kind of kept going where yeah maybe then me or gary or yourself is the one that bought gracie advanced or, or something you know what I'm saying? <laughs> the next, and they're like, i guess you're the leader <laughs> like you know and then and then we just fell into this role right and then absolutely yeah, here well, we and are. then you you know you you just find out and, oh wait a second all of a sudden i've got a club here and i i'm in charge of this thing you know yeah. me and the the three other guys and we started uh, ground zero up in morgantown around 96 so actually ground zero is not going to be named ground zero it was ground there's a, zero how'd you come up with that name that, that's, well uh, originally the club was going to be called ronin jiu-jitsu okay uh but right. that fell apart because john oliverio ordered a bunch of t-shirts and he misspelled ronin and put rowan jiu-jitsu mm. and he didn't want to put out any more money to get ronin jiu-jitsu so anyway it just we did away with ronin because we didn't have a teacher and that's why we kind of went with ronin theme meaning the the uh, masterless samurai uh, as a as a central figure and then we decide you know what ground zero you know like because we're starting from ground friggin' zero none of us knew anything we didn't have anything and we're just piecemealing this together as best we can and so we called it ground zero well, and it's a good name it's funny because I, I was watching a movie the other night and they were training at like ground zero boxing right like i don't think it's a real gym but they picked that name you know and i was like what because I, I kept looking around i was like wonder <laughs> if i'll see anybody i know and then i realized well this is just a movie they had, like these are all fake people i don't think it's a real gym so so we're not gonna see nobody but, but you know like and this will be good too because we can tell gary like, some of this stuff too just like we're telling everybody else i mean uh, you guys are a motivation it was so i i had learned i think the way that we had kind of first hooked up and knew about each other there's two different ways like one like i said i remember us buying some mats like somebody from your team had some mats and i think it was in clarksburg or morgantown and that's when i was training with the walls brothers uh jason and johnny walls at jason yeah 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 and he was at that time a hook and shoot champion in like the prank pancreas style and it was actually very good another guy that learned just from gracie videos had no formal training but he was very unorthodox and and won almost all his fights with arm bars and uh Anyway, I, I do remember, like, I don't remember who, but I just met because I remember Phil talking about it because he's like, man, that Jason guy's really good. He's catching arm bars from positions that we're just not used to. And I, so I knew that's how I knew Phil was there because I, it was like a blur to me. I don't remember that day hardly. I, I just know we're because I was so new to jujitsu and those guys too. Like, when people train, like, everybody was new. I, I just couldn't keep track of anything. But so anyway, I know that everybody came down. So I had met some people there, but specifically you was when we had Kaiki down um for a seminar mm -hmm. in charleston so th through a guy named morgan hayes the late morgan hayes um, yeah and he had trained at torrance with the gracies and kaiki was there at the time and apparently kaiki, he got blue belt through them yeah and then apparently there's a falling out so kaiki went kind of like on his own thing and because i remember that he's wanting us to be a t like part of his team you know because he was like look i don't have the gracie name and, and that's back when when a academy started like everybody's just looking for the Gracies, right? So if you had the Gracie name, like you immediately had good business. And that was like what Kaiki was saying. He's like, I don't have that name. Like, so I like, would love for you guys to join up and do this and that. And uh, right, we didn't, but but it like, not for any reason. I don't remember why we didn't, but anyway. So then you, you came down and Phil uh, was down from Morgantown. And, you know, I, it's like, again, that was so long ago. It was like, it was like 97, 98, right? It's so long ago, but. It was awesome because I remember every now and then those, those pictures would come up on Facebook where I posted them and I always share them because it's like all of us in there as white belts. And I remember doing like pretty basic stuff, right? Like we were passing guard by like collar choking somebody, stuff that you would never do now. But that's literally what that's what they taught. And, they, and I was laughing kind of in my head when when uh, when Ashley was talking about those Gracie videos, because especially in the basic ones, it was like Alio showing you how to pass guard by sticking your arm through the guard and giving up a triangle. But that's like I never I really I actually would like to ask them that question because I would like and I think I did ask him that question one time because I was like are you showing people the wrong stuff on purpose or something because you know like I would never do that 
However, in 2004, I trained with Elio and he showed that same guard pass in 2004 uh, to me. And I said the same thing there secretly. <laughs> like, actually, I said it out loud because like Henner or one of the grandsons heard me and I was like, you know, I was like, oh, shit, I'm gonna get my ass kicked because I was like, because I think I was like, Can I be <laughs> you know, and uh, they said, hey, I'm with you. Like, I wouldn't do it either. But if you're down, you know, and there's like 30 seconds left, like then maybe you would do this because then he go for a triangle and you're going to get out. And he's like, also remember, my grandfather's teaching this for self-defense. Like they don't know how to triangle you. So that's how you get, you know, there's like a different thing, but, but anyway, yeah, those videos, even though we all learned on them, they, they were not the best videos, right? They were pretty, you know, for the time. And, and look, I could be wrong. I don't want to, I'm not smashing that or, you know, I, I haven't also watched those since the nineties either. Maybe they're better than I remember, but uh, they were all we had for sure. That and UFCs, right? That was it. That was it. Yeah. yeah. Well, and, you, uh, you guys come a long yeah, way sure. since then, by the way. I'll also, I just because I want to do this real quick, because there's not like a lot of people on my Instagram, but I did tell them I was going to announce it. So you guys won that team championship again. Obviously, that's another. This wasn't uh, planned, but since you're on, it was a good timing. So for people on my Instagram waiting, <laughs> I was like, I better do this before they kick my ass. So, um, <laughs> so there you go. And so, so congratulations on that. And that's another thing, like. Gary, so you, you may or may not know Ashley's team, and especially when they combine as SAS, and they, they had this year wasn't like, even though it's still called SAS, it wasn't like um, teams from Ohio were kind of joining in. That's happened in the past, and it was still pretty close, like, because the Ground Zero Morgantown, which they stay separate, a lot of times it's between those two guys, right? And uh, this time, I don't, the Ground Zero didn't have a, a heavy presence at this one, the Morgantown guys, but but the Huntington guys did too. And I'm pretty sure, like, I even stopped counting at a, a certain point because I was like, it's not going to be close. Like, they're, they're doing pretty darn good. So, so, you guys, congratulations. So, yeah. I'm Thank awesome. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And, and that's also why, why you're like a legend. That's what I would say. Like, you guys have been kicking butt for years. Um, you know, like, I mean, really, for years, you've had guys in, in UFCs, big, big things, Bellator, UFC, you've had great guys in jiu-jitsu. Um, it's, it's really amazing to me as a fellow West Virginian, and I, and I think you guys need credit. And, you know, sad, Gary, that you don't know of all this West Virginia prominence, Gary, but I'm trying to teach you. <laughs> well, here's the thing. Now, maybe I didn't know Ashley's name, but I've known about Ground Zero, and I've been competing at WVGO for, uh, well, not so much now, but I've been doing jujitsu a decade. And in that, that 10 years, I, I, you know, a lot of that time has been spent in West Virginia and Virginia where you've had the WVGO go on. And I know when I'm going, who I'm going up against there and the W like at those WVGOs, also the Fuji's, some of the Nagas, um, ground zero is there so it's maybe Ashley's name isn't coming up, but I, I know ground zero and those guys are, like if I've got a ground zero guy, it's usually a fight. Absolutely. Well, well that's, that's good to hear. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think Ashley does a good job. I mean, like flying under the radar. I don't know if you do it on purpose, right? Like, cause in, in Gary from your, uh, Gary McConaughey, we talked about one time in a parking mm -hmm. lot in Charleston, he was coming to pick up one of the banners you won. And he said, man, I, I get on them all the time because they don't advertise like you do. And he's like, you know, I see your name out there and you do this. And he's like, I tell them that we got to do the same thing. And I was like, well, this man, like, you know, like I do it for same reason, like somebody like Marcelo's one. I was like, hey, you need a brand, do this, do that, do it. But you putting your name out there is not always the best thing, right? Like, especially like if you're Bobcat MMA or Ground Zero, that's great. And I used to be Advanced BKJ. We talked about that. The reason why right. it was an A, it made me first in the phone book back when there's phone phone books, right? But that was nice because then you you flew under the radar in a way, right? When you put your name on something, then then it's instead of saying like advanced BKJ sucks, or like Butch House sucks. Like it's different when your name <laughs> when, when your name is on it. Yeah. yeah, it's it's different. So like in a way, like I like I that's great if that's what you're doing. Like it's a good idea. Like I wish I could do it. I mean, I changed uh, an advice of Marcelo for good or bad, right? And it, there is definitely some good to come out of it. But um, but yeah, and I think that's why, right? When you have like Bobcat MMA or Ground Zero sometimes you don't know who's teaching the place like so gary didn't know he just knew those guys are tough man like he knows when he sees those but this is the guy i mean this is this is the man and he, they have a lot of instructors for that like tim um tim dunlap and 
obviously a bunch of people, right? Like, but you've had a host of people. And then, you know, I think you're, you know, for like, you're definitely the leader of the group that I think you deserve more credit. And it's not out there. And that's kind of what I wanted today to be about too, is that for people that don't know that don't train, they're like, here's the man, this is the guy, this is the guy that a lot of us, especially in West Virginia, that owe like a lot of respect to a lot of admiration to and, um, and you're important, very important. Well, I, I really appreciate that, Butch. It's awkward. And I, you know, it's, it's weird how things happen. You know, I never set out, like you said, with the idea of trying to, you know, do anything of the sort. And I know you've done the same thing. You've influenced a lot of people, like a lot of people, to the tune of thousands of people. And in the course of doing jujitsu, teaching jujitsu and martial arts, you're altering people's lives, whether you know it or not. There's a transformative element to learning martial arts, which, I, of course, we knew, it, and Gary, I'm sure you knew too. When when you feel it, when you undertake martial arts as a hobby, as a as a, and sometimes more as a, a lifestyle, uh, it's very transformative in just about every way. And then when you are able to help other people in that same transformative process. My God, it is absolutely satisfying. It is yeah. absolutely a satisfying thing. When you instill confidence in someone that doesn't have any, has never had any, and all of a sudden they're in control of their lives where they never were before. When they're, they have now discovered an inner strength and develop a physical outer strength in mm -hmm. the process. I mean, you can turn people around with it. And I know you have, and I have too, and it's just absolutely the most fulfilling thing activity i've undertaken in my life i mean i'm an attorney and i very much love practicing law uh but i i very much have a passion for jujitsu and coaching and, and teaching and helping others become better human beings and i i do that through jujitsu i know you do too i don't know if you get that same uh feeling Actually, you know, a big thing that me and Butch have talked a lot about, not only on this podcast, but in just, just in conversation is, you know, it's kind of like, what, what is our footprint going to be when we're gone? Right. And a big part of jujitsu for me is helping people find out in, in I, I'm, I'm a huge thief of of sayings and metaphors and similes and so i'm probably i know i'm stealing this from somebody but the beautiful thing about jujitsu is one it teaches the the people who are smaller and weaker that they're stronger than what they think they are and it Absolutely. teaches and it teaches people who are big and strong that they're not as big and strong as they think they are and it's a beautiful equalizer and it's it's such a it's such a metaphor for life and just every, every day, right? Every day I find something where, you know, a, a principle that I learned in jujitsu affects, it, I can use that to solve problems in my everyday life. And me and Butch have talked so much about that, like how we can use what we're learning on the mat, whether it be some, some days it's discipline and some days it's like, you know, persevering and some days it's like being good to someone who's new at something. You don't always have to smash everybody. Sometimes it's about helping people. And, and jujitsu, I, I, so many people have said it. And, 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 and you and Butch obviously are at the forefront of that. If you guys were doing it in 96, 97, 98, like jujitsu makes you a better person everywhere in life. You're a better husband. You're a better, you're a better worker. You're a better uh, citizen. And, it, and it's amazing how everybody has that. Everybody finds it in jujitsu. There's not anyone that I've ever talked to that's ever done jujitsu who isn't, who doesn't accredit that to be being a better person. Did you guys listen to the recent uh, Hicks and Gracie podcast on Joe Rogan or have you hit that yet? Not, not no, there yet. It, it's good. So one of the, they talk about this exactly. And of course, I mean, you guys have put it very eloquently, but obviously Hickson has too, because he spent so many years preaching jujitsu, right? But that's yeah. one of the things he said, just, you know, he talked about one of his fights early on, 19 years old, when he fought that Zulu guy, right? We all watched Gracie in action. He's 19, never fought before. And apparently that Zulu was like 115 and 0 or something, you know, something crazy. 
but he said he actually quit in between rounds. It was kind of neat to hear that story. You know, he said he he told his dad, yeah, hey, I'm I'm done, I'm tired, and and then his dad said, no, he, he just ignored him, right, and just said, yeah, you you could beat him now. He's tired. He's t more tired than you. Just go out there and you're gonna beat him. You know, and blah blah blah. So and more of stories he did in the next three minutes. So he's right, but he said for the rest of his life, he realized the biggest demon or enemy he had it was himself, right. Was, Absolutely. And he to be fighting two people. He needed to fight one person. So he needed to quench that that demon inside of his head. And he spent the rest of his life doing that. And he and so he he expanded upon that and said, that's what jujitsu does. Like when we're tired and we're out there and you want to quit, and then you reach deeper, and then you you keep going and and you find out you're better than what you were. That's jujitsu. And then he was saying just what you guys just said, that it makes you a better husband, a better, more patient, right? All those things, you know, like. All of a sudden, now you, you, you're not fighting. You, you've conquered that demon, right? And so, your life's just better overall, right? And he said again, I'm like he says it way better. Like I loved. There's there was times just listening to it, and there was nothing emotional, but I was almost getting teary eyed because he put it so so crazy. You know, like a lot of like his podcast and Jean Jacques on there, like were so good because jujitsu is life for them, and that's the part that was actually making me teary eyed because I was like, no, jujitsu for me, I, even though it does help my life that's where I fell short as a martial artist when they say they're real martial artists, like, because I didn't keep it in my life. Like he was saying, I don't eat chocolate. I don't eat ice cream. I don't drink. Cause it, that'll make me bad at jujitsu. And I was like, I eat all those things. <laughs> <And> <laughs> so like on and on, you Not know, me. yeah, that's what I'm saying. Same here, man. You know, by the way, what's uh, what brands of, uh, of bourbon did you guys get today? I'm doing a whistle pig. Oh, some whistle pig's good, Gary. What do you... I, I've actually got Dickel uh, rye. All right, I got me some Basil Hayden in my uh, wife's boss lady glass. So you know, very nice. Feeling feeling fancy, but uh, but anyway, yeah. So what you're saying? Well, Hickson. I tell you what, Hickson for me is. I, I I've always absolutely idolized Hickson. Absolutely, mm. I, I'm still a fanboy. I'm a fanboy of Hickson. And, and will be forever yeah uh because you know I, I you know there's an argument to be made that marcelo garcia is the best of all time there's an argument to be made that hodger gracie is the best of all time there's an argument to be i mean you can make an argument and there'll be arguments to be made for people on down the road but at least hickson will always be mentioned in the crowd of best of all time because at the time when all these great people, Jean-Jacques, Hegan, uh, anybody with the last name Gracie, anybody who trained any jujitsu at all in the 80s and 90s will tell you and, and has rolled with Hickson will unquestionably say he is a grade A badass. He whipped the shit out of me. He whipped the shit out of Fabio Grigel when Fabio Grigel was the world champion, beat his ass. And Fabio said as much, said, I have never been beaten like that. They had a closed door session. Fabio uh, had, had allegedly said, I, I've never been beaten like that in my life. And everyone who had rolled with him in a 20, 25, maybe 30 year span. Absolutely. Said the same thing. And so with that, it's just a, a, a credit to living the life of jujitsu, living the martial life, living a samurai life uh, in real time, not fiction. That dude lived it and, and believed it. And, and his jujitsu is arguably the most beautiful expression of jujitsu there's been. Uh, of course, jujitsu evolves. Yeah. And that's, you know, where we are today. Jiu-jitsu is constantly evolving. How do you guys deal with the evolution of jujitsu? Good question, Gary. You want to tackle that one first? No, I'll... Okay. So for me, now I, I I originally was under a Helsing Gracie school, and uh, so it was very much Elio Gracie jujitsu. Uh, drill the basics. Drill the basics. Drill the basics. Drill the basics. And when you're done with that, drill the basics. Um, you know, and, and, and that carried me a long way in competition. I did, I did really good for myself in competition, um, uh, all the way through purple belt. I'm a brown belt now under Butch, but I, I still rely on all those basics. Um, oh yeah. I, 
I am having a hard time dealing with the evolution uh, because it feels like the game is going no gi. And the older I get, the more I like gi because I like having breaks. <laughs> Uh, it, you know, and I'm, I'm 40 now and it's hard to keep up with 20 year olds the way I was when I was 30. And so it's nice to have a handle on something that I can hold and slow everything down. Uh, and it allows you to be more methodical. I think the gi, uh, you can definitely you can be more technical, technical. Yeah. And so I get, I like that aspect of the game that it's, it's, uh, it's chess, you know, uh, I like that part. Uh, as far as the evolution, though, I definitely want to know more, and there's so much there's so much more to know. Um, Dean Lister was just in over at uh, over in Charleston, and that was a, an amazing experience. And just something I finding out how much I didn't know about the straight ankle lock was amazing <laughs> to me. It's like yeah, how's that for a humbling thing? <laughs> and, and that's the beauty about it, right? It's like no matter how. Every time Helson would come in, when I would go to a Helson seminar, it was the same way. It was like, okay, I know how to do an arm bar, but I didn't know. I was a, deep into my blue belt, getting ready to get my purple belt. I still wasn't doing arm bars the way I was supposed to be doing arm bars. And I had submitted dozens of guys in competition with arm bars. I thought, man, my arm bar is pretty good. And the, the truth was, is that I was still screwing it up three, three fourths of the way through. And, and it was the same thing when Dean Lister came in with the, the straight ankle. I, by uh, prior to Dean Lister seminar, I have probably seven or eight competition wins via straight ankle lock. And this is at purple belt and above. And uh, so I thought I was, Hey, I'm pretty good at straight ankle locks. I've got quite a few submission wins via straight ankle lock. And then he would show like, no, you like, you're doing this wrong with your, your foot on the outside. You should really be, he calls it the doorstop. You should be doing this doorstop and leaning to the other side. It was just like, man, I'm really all this, all this time I was doing it the way I thought was good and it wasn't good. And so it's just, it's always, you know, it's, it, that's the beautiful thing about jujitsu is that it's, it's, there's always something more to learn. Uh, there's always something that can be improved and not to take away from Elio or Hickson or any of those guys, but it's still growing. It's not, it, it hasn't reached maturity yet. And that's the beautiful oh, thing about it. Oh, it's still a baby. Yeah. This thing, this still, this thing's just now getting the solid food. Yeah. Uh, it's Boy. not, uh, it's still shitting its pants. <laughs> it really is in its infancy. Uh, and it is growing and it's exponentially growing. As you can tell, there's, it is, it is absolutely impossible to keep up, which I find A, inspiring, B, discouraging, that you cannot keep up with all the evolutions. It is impossible to keep up with all the evolutions between the leg locking systems that are coming out, between, you know, the multiple guards that are coming out, the guard in each, you know, guard variation has a slight system that springs off of it so you've got a system for you know that you can get inundated with for every little variation the inverted and whatever you know there's all kinds of iterations of different guards different uh, attacking styles and it, it, it it's inspiring in that yes i have more to learn and it's also discouraging in that, shit, that is a ton of stuff to learn. And there's absolutely no way I'm ever going to learn it all. I, uh, I, so you've got to kind of come to terms with what it is you're capable of doing. Like, I, you know, I don't go inverted a lot. You know, I'm, I'm 50 years old now. You know, if I'm going inverted, something's gone wrong. <laughs> uh, and... So, you know, I'm with you in that my game is very basic and it has been basic. And I think there is a very, and that's what I teach uh, primarily is, is a basics driven, fundamentals driven jujitsu uh, curriculum up to purple belt. Like I, I have a philosophy at my school and that is I'm going to teach you into your purple. 
okay? I will teach you well into your purple. I'll get you about two stripe purple, maybe a little more. But after that, that's the platform from which you grow. That's a platform from which you find your way because not everything, not every style is gonna work for everybody because everybody's got their own physical limitations, whether it's strength, flexibility, endurance, whether it's lack of coordination or injuries, whatever. Everybody's got their own things that work for them. So everybody's got their own superpowers and everybody's got their own drawbacks. And you're, you know, I, you can, I think everybody can get a nice solid fundamental basis up to and including mid range plus of purple. And then after that, you know, and I try to encourage my, my students after that, don't, you know, I'll, I'll show you what I can, but this is where you vault off on your own, you know, start flapping your own wings at purple plus, and, and I'll help you where I can. But this is, you know, there's plenty of people at our school that have differing styles than mine or differing styles than Tim Dunlaps or Gary McConaughey or Josh Hensley, we've got, a, you know, Sean Ross, we've got a lot of black belts at our school, which I'm very fortunate uh, to have, and, and, but each of them have a different way of doing things, and everybody needs to discover and find their way of doing things, and there's no one way to do it, and that's kind of beautiful. Everybody can find their jujitsu. Well, that's that's the art part of the martial arts, right? Is is that you get to express yourself in your own way, right? I, and that's how what I believe the art part of martial arts, man. I, I really do. Is that you're going to express yourself through the through the martial arts system, and that's going to be beautiful. It's going to be your way, like, and that's not everywhere. But I think the best schools are the schools that are not cookie cutters of the instructor, right? It doesn't mean you don't have good fundamentals. That is jujitsu. But then at a certain point, we talk about it often at our places, all of us know a guillotine, but how many, how many times you watch a UFC or something, and everybody like this guy just, he's hitting guillotines from everywhere. Or a guy, or Ronda Rousey hitting arm bars from everywhere. We all know an arm bar, but it's like, that's her expression of her art, right? She loves the arm bar and she mm -hmm. expresses her, and then she's doing beautiful things. And, and it was like team alpha male, right? Those little, the wrestler, I mean, they were, they're hitting chokes from everywhere and you wouldn't think, right? But then I heard them say like, I don't remember it was your eye favor or whoever, but they were just like, you always attack the head. They had, they had a philosophy, right? And so then, you know, they, they were definitely hunting the head down and doing different stuff. And it kind of let in, it was beautiful. Like to me, that's all beautiful. And, mm -hmm. and to expand what, and, you know, on your question too, is I'm with you guys, like, right? Like everything you said is exactly right. Like, it's 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 discouraging in a way when we say that doesn't mean that we're not we're not happy that jujitsu is going places but it discourages you when you're 40 or 50 you're like god i worked so hard to become a black belt and now i feel like i know nothing which goes back to the phrase that it you're starting all over right oh and good it, lord you're right yeah and it, it and it like remember we've all heard that all of us and we're like yeah, whatever. That's because you're a black belt. That's why you say that. <laughs> like, you think it's just lip service, and then you get there, and then, and then you know, if some guy comes up and he says, "How how do I do a, a, a Baron Ball or Brimblow?" You know, how do I do this? And like, you you should have the answers. I'm the leader of the school, and that's you're like, and that's I, and I did fall short. I'll be honest, I did fell short for there for a while for different reasons. Where meaning that I wasn't studying stuff, and I almost bragged about it sometimes because people ask me, I'm like, "Look, I don't need to know that stuff. Like, I'll learn it when I need to know it." You know. And I didn't truly believe those words coming out of my mouth. I wasn't being cocky. I meant it because, yeah, it's like, I also felt so busy that I, when am I going to find time to keep learning all this stuff? Right. And, but that's where I fell short because, and then again, that's what I was saying about today. That's where I felt short on jujitsu because it, I wasn't doing the art, the martial art that we love justice. I wasn't continuing to learn all the time and doing and staying up to date and doing those things. Not because I didn't want to, it was just, I, it's just like everything else. When somebody like you ask somebody if they work out, like I don't have time. We all got time. I'm sure you did. Earlier. <laughs> right? It's the same thing. I was like, I don't have time to learn all this jujitsu. That's the exact same. I don't have time to lose weight. It's the same phrase. I have time. I got to make time. And I wasn't making time and I, I, I fell short and I'm correcting that now. So like it's the same thing. So, and that was the part where you have to embrace that. Like I don't have all the answers. And I think that was the other thing too, as a teacher, as a, as a, I was a black belt too. 
you almost fall into some of the things sometimes, or at least I did, meaning that, you know, people look to you like you have all the answers and then you almost want to become that person, you know? And then if you don't have the answers, maybe you run from it. Maybe that's what I did. I didn't know, you know, I just avoid it. And now I'm like, I'm comfortable saying, I don't know, but I'll go find the answer. Let's go figure it out together. Right. And I had to get to that point. Um, and so that's the point, right? You have to, you have to embrace the evolution and you have to say just what Ashley said and what we've all said that I can just say that's not in my game. That's why I don't know it. You know, um, I don't invert or I don't do this. I don't do that. But let's learn it because I need to know it. I need to know it to be good, a d- good teacher. And I need to teach like if you're in a tournament, I need to tell you how to get out of that or how to avoid it or it's coming. Right. Like, you know, and I, again, I fell short for that for a while and I, I'm correcting that. But it's daunting. It's a lot of stuff. It means that you have to keep studying for the rest of your life. You really, really, you really do. And it's not going to stop. If, well, now, if anything, it's going to pick up steam. Absolutely. Well, this, this kind of brings me to a question because I've been doing jujitsu almost a decade now. And I know. Oh, you're a me, baby. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm still a baby. <laughs> Listen, I, nah, I'm, I'm like, I'm, I can, I'm just teasing I'm, you. No, 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 no. But I am. Truthfully, I am. But here's, you know, everybody talks about blue belt blues and we lose a lot of blue belts. And now I'm, I'm you know, I'm pretty certain that I'll get my black belt one day. I don't know how, how far away it is. I'm a brown belt now. I'll get my black belt one day. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. Jiu-jitsu is well, not Butch and I talked me. about that earlier and I just settle in for a while. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with it. Let me sandbag. We have another announcement. <laughs> I, I want to sandbag for as long as I can. So let's leave it that away. I don't want any expectations. But I am curious, like you, you're, you know, we're talking about not to date you, and I apologize. Uh, we're coming. Go ahead. Ah, that 1996. We're coming up on 30 years of, of jujitsu. What keeps you in it? How, what what 1994, brings you back? Actually. Am I right? 1994, really, is when you started, Ashley? Did I hear that That's right? when we started uh, playing in the yard. Let's put it that way. My dad, dad was really questioning what we were doing in 1994 between each other's legs on a mat, sweating on each other. He really had some questions about that. Hey, wait, wait hold up. My wife, my wife is and asking he was me like, the same what, thing. What are you guys doing? What are you doing here? And he, he really didn't understand we were doing martial arts he was like it doesn't look like you're wrestling because someone's back is totally on the ground and no one's getting pinned yeah, what are you guys doing and yeah. it's a stack pass it's a stack pass. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, don't mind us. <laughs> what keeps me going is honestly having a school if i didn't have a school and if i didn't have that pressure to keep going because it is easy to get distracted in life gary it's a great question and i encourage you and and anyone that that is listening to take inventory of your life regularly and find out the things that are donating to your growth and keep that part of your formula all right you've got parts of your life that are a form are, are part of your formula variables in your formula that lead to your success there are things that are unquestionably good for you and there are things that are unquestionably bad for you and you over time you know if you lead a a good life you keep the things that are adding and, and 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 help you grow as a human and you discard the things that were you know were working at one time but aren't working for you now go ahead and it's okay to discard things or people for that matter that are no longer fitting in your life and and helping you grow as a human being growing constant growth is essential in life and you've got to grow physically you've got to grow intellectually and you've got to grow spiritually and when you have growth in all three of those areas you're going to have a good life your things are going to click for you and for me, and this is what I, I, I preach to my students, if you can only have one extra activity in your life, whether, you know, in, in life, you know, as you get older, and you guys know, you, you get a wife, you get a child, you get a business, you get a career, you get obligations outside of the family, you get obligations with the family. 
it's really tough to carve the time out for yourself and for jujitsu. But if you can only find one extra activity, it should be jujitsu. It should always be jujitsu. Find time for that. Everything else can go to hell. What about sex? All your other side things can go to hell. Your one task should be jujitsu because you will find intellectual growth, spiritual growth, and, and physical growth through jujitsu. I firmly and absolutely wholeheartedly believe that. And I encourage everybody to, to embrace that. Uh, and and I, I encourage all my students in, in the same vein. Carve the time. You will not regret ever, ever in your life will you regret being good at jujitsu. That will never happen. That's a good point. You didn't hear, I said, what about sex? But not to interrupt your whole speech because it was, it was a very good speech. <laughs> I was just trying to lighten the mood, but it's <laughs> sorry, I got on a soapbox there. Butch, I get no. on a soapbox sometimes, and my students will tell you, oh God, there he goes again. <laughs> no, it, it was perfect. I was I was trying to mess with you, but it was perfect. No, because when honestly, it, it, when I was talking about that podcast, it, that's what you know Hickson and Joe Rogan both e echoed, right? And Joe Rogan and uh, Jocko Willink, for that matter, have been monumental in getting new students in, in all of our gyms, I'm sure. I've had people that literally told me, I'm here because Jocko told me to be here, or something like, <laughs> literally, straight out of their mouth, right? And it's in they, the way that they are able to articulate what you just said. Like, if, if you're on the same podcast saying what you just said, which is exactly what they say, it, it motivates people, because they're like, wait a minute, what? This guy is talking, if he has one activity, this is what he needs to do more than sex, more than he needs to do this. What is this? Why, why is this such a big deal? And then we can go on and on about all the things that it's done for us and for the people that we've, we've shared it with. And it is amazing, right? Like it is like, honestly, and, it, and I'm, I'm so thankful too that my one, maybe my only hobby, my main hobby for sure, doesn't cost me any money. Like, you know what I'm saying like when I meet people, <laughs> that hunts or fish. Well, there's they, one of us. Yeah. yeah like, <laughs> well, there you go, man. I just feel so, so like, like, it's, like, like I was talking to somebody that hunted the other day and I love, I don't hunt, but I love talking to people because it's, they share the passion of hunting like we do jujitsu, right? And they're like, you know, they're just so into it. And, I, and that's sometimes they'll ask for like feedback from me. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'm really happy for you. Like, I feel like I, I can just, I feel your enthusiasm and, and I don't know what it's like to cover myself in deer piss and sit in a tree for hours, but you love it. And then, and they would say the same for us. Like, I have no idea what it's like to be in between a man's legs, sweating all over me, but you love it. And I'm like, yeah, it's equally as I, but I love it. Yeah, it's my passion, you know? So it's very similar, but, but it is true. Like, you know, and, and, and really, honestly, actually hearing those guys talk, I'm not, not bad enough, there, but like, I, and I, I guess that's the thing. I, when I find somebody that has a passion like we do, it is amazing. And then especially when they can articulate it like that. And it means something like that we all, we all shared briefly and we didn't really expand upon it, but we did share like, we've had such an impact on people and it's weird to say it, right? Because now we're kind of tuning our horn and I don't, I don't mean to do that by any means, right? It, but we know it's happened, right? Like I've seen people in, in my gym that either lost weight, right? It changed their lives and made sure. them a different person or somebody that was bullied and picked on and now they're not. Or, you know, I have a couple of guys now that they're just totally different people, like to socially, mentally different people, right? And one of the, while you're talking, I was this, I, and I guess this is a good segue to do that, not to interrupt everything you just said, but do you have, Ashley, I'll ask you first and then Gary next since I'm asking the question, but do you have a person or a thing that you're most proud of? You know what I mean? Like, and again, you've had people, you've had fighters in UFC and Bellator, that could be something to be proud of, but is it more a, just a person that it changed their life or it could be anything. What, what, what makes you, if you had to look back on this, you know, since 1994 and it could be more than one, cause it's sometimes hard to pick man, you know um, what do you think? It's a tough one to ask on a question. Well, uh, it is tough to ask. <laughs> yeah. And, and I don't, I don't, again, I've enjoyed the benefit of having a long time. And, and one of the other benefits I've had is I was one of the first people, and you know, too, because you are one of the first people in the state getting involved in jujitsu mm -hmm. and starting a school. And there's, 
folks, there's a lot of benefit to being the first. Yeah. Uh, you know, you get to establish roots and, you know, you get to, you get the benefit of being able to piss on all the corners and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you, you can stake your ground yeah. and uh, there's a lot of benefit to that in, in a lot of different arenas. Uh, but what, um, it's difficult to pin it down, but I have had, you know, Dustin Hazlett, who was a student mine, and he had Terrible a comments. UFC career. Um, so he, speaking of your internet phrase real quick, but I think it's coming back, but he, did he win, he won submission of the night a couple of times, right? Yes, he did. And I think his, he may have a couple of submissions that are still in the UFC submission top 10. I'm not sure if they still are, but he's had some excellent submissions. And he almost mentioned my name with oh, Joe Rogan. I was so happy because, <laughs> you know, I, I had always taught him and I teach my students. There's only so many submissions, but there's a thousand ways to get to those endpoints, you know, and you find a way to get to those you know, a straight arm bar, heel hook, straight ankle lock, guillotine, you know, Kimura, you know, you find a way to get there. There's only, honestly, if you boil it down, there's only a handful or two of finishing points, but a million ways to get there. And he was really, really good at finding unorthodox ways to get to submissions. And anyway, that, that, Dustin Hazlett was, I was so proud of him and his accomplishment. And, you know, he was able to grow and, and he went and trained with who my instructor ultimately uh, is, is George Gurgel. And thank you, George. Uh, he helped us, helped me and helped our whole school in, in an ungodly fashion. And I'm eternally grateful for George. Uh, but you know, it, it, Dustin Hazlett, uh, you know, I've got uh, Dustin Ware, who now has his own academy. He was a student of mine. Now he has his own academy in, in Columbus. You know, I've got uh, Josh Souter, who runs Checkmat down in Florida. You know, I mean, I've just got all kinds of people. Brian Anderson was a student of mine. Um, I, I just I could go on and on and I'm just immensely proud and I know I'm leaving a lot of people out but I can't narrow it down any further no, it's, it's tough that's why I knew, I knew that question is kind of a loaded question right like because it's hard like I, if I gave you that I want to apologize to anybody I left out there because I'm very very intensely proud of so many people well absolutely and that's what I'm saying if I gave you that question you had you had time to sit down and write it on a piece of paper you, it could come up and that was a great answer you well shit uh-oh. You still there, Butch? Yeah. I don't know where the picture went. Are you there? I, I'm here. Okay. I see both. There we go. All yeah. right. Just, I thought the whole thing went down. Sorry about that. Anyway. But uh, so anyway, I was just saying that that is a great answer. And it's hard to pick in that amount of time. Because given the same. What about you? Talking, I, could, I couldn't. Let me up. pitch that back at you. Well, I, I, I'll go ahead and jump in real quick. Because I yeah. like we're. I, Bobcat is a year old, so I don't have a lot of uh, a lot of time under. So why Bobcat? Hold on, back up a second. Why Bobcat? I, I want to know. Uh, listen, one hundred percent, it was marketing. Athens, Ohio, Bobcat, Ohio University. So I, I am unoriginal. <laughs> I steal shameless. everything. Absolutely shameless. I steal everything. <laughs> I steal everything. But and part of it, listen, like jujitsu, it's all theft. I stole everything that I did. I stole from what is before me. So I, I am not original in the, in, in jujitsu. All I am an original in is how I teach or how I share. That's the only thing that I can be original in because everything is it's, it's really already been done. I'm just regurgitating information. Um, and I'm sure you're refining too. I hope that I, I am. I hope you that know, I am. And, and I'm sure Butch would agree. Sometimes I, you know, I take things that I've learned and I've refined them to a sharper edge than what I got. And, yeah. and I'm sure you have too. Uh, and Gary. and, I, and I, I certainly hope that is the case when it comes to situations that I'm most proud of. 
it and this is really where it comes down for me is like the people who come back and maybe this is self-indulgent and i'd be lying if it wasn't but if somebody comes and tries a class and then they come back to another class and then they sign up for classes and then they start paying monthly that one that means that i'm giving them something that they want and need and that is, there's something for me that is gratifying. Um, but then two, like, I've, I've got a, I've, there was a girl in my kid's class and she didn't feel right. She's been tomboyish. And she, her mom came to me and said, you know, hey, she really doesn't feel like, or uh, her mom came to me after, this is after a couple of months of doing jujitsu. Her mom came to me and said, I want you to know that she didn't feel like she fit in anywhere. And she always felt out of place because she always wanted to do the boy thing. She was rough and tumble and no one ever felt her. No one ever made her feel like she was in a space that was hers. And then she came to your class and she felt that she belonged. And I think not that any, not that anybody else ever, like not that anybody else didn't mean as much. But that statement hit me harder than any statement that's ever been said about anything that I've ever done in life. I made somebody feel that they belong somewhere. And so for me, like that was my most proud moment, I guess, of something that I did is because now somebody feels like they have a home and that 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 would hit me the hardest. Well, everybody needs a tribe. Yeah, everybody needs a tribe and everybody's searching for a tribe. They may not know where their tribe is yet. And those are the people that fall into gangs or fall into even seedier places than gangs. You know, they can fall into a drug culture or a drinking culture or a dark league culture. You know, everybody has to have a tribe. And some tribes are beneficial tribes and other tribes are absolute scourges. And that's awesome that you offered this girl who was searching. Clearly she was searching and her mom knew she was searching and she was searching for something and you offered it. She found it and you may have a lifer. I certainly hope so. I certainly hope so. But, and it's those things. It's the, for me, it's the people that come back. You know, it used to be, jujitsu used to be for me. And I was 100% up until purple belt, I was certainly selfish with jujitsu. Now I would share time with people and I would definitely, if I knew something then I would try and share that. If it was some, some technique that I was good at, I would share it with people. But up until purple belt, I was selfish. I was in jujitsu for me. And what I got out of jujitsu was competition and going to competition and winning. And I wanted to win and I stole time for my family. And, and if you're going to compete, there is a certain part of you, we've talked about this, Butch, that you need to be selfish and you have to dedicate to you if you want to win. Um, you know, I can't be home every night because I got to go train because I know everybody else is training. And uh, so there's a big part of my jujitsu that was selfish. And I think since Purple Belt and on, especially since I'm teaching, I'm getting more out of teaching. It's the selflessness of jujitsu. And I actually enjoy that more than I did the selfishness of jujitsu when I was competing. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Well, that, so for me, that's a tough one to follow, Gary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> <it really sucks. laughs> yes. yeah. I mean, that's what I was thinking that whole time you're talking, not that it, I wasn't listening to it, but I was just like, God, there's nothing I can say. After this. <laughs> <laughs> Almost we should just say that was good and we'll skip me. But uh, no, I, I don't, I think I echo, I don't have anything because I'm, I'm like Ashley, you know, I obviously I'm the one who started the question, but it would take me some time to, to think. And there's probably a million stories and that's what, that's what's tough. And I, I can remember, you know, a similar story, like I, like kind of, I've had nerd, all of us, we had some nerdy guys came, right. And, and they got better. And I remember a guy getting in a fight and didn't necessarily win the fight, put the guy in the guard and, and just survive but he was saying how much bigger the guy was and then he would have got his ass kicked before and he called to thank me it was a weird call because i was like oh did you win and no no not really you know but he's like i just put him in guard and held his head and you know did old school ufc thing he's like so i didn't get beat up and i told the guy like hey you know and the guy was like let me go and he's like no you got to get out and the guy couldn't get out so he quit he's like so i kind of won but kind of not because he punched me until we fell down 
and then he's like, I didn't really do nothing, you know, but it still was, it was impressive. Right. And, and so there's a lot of stories like that and similar stories that you, you have Gary where parents have said great things. And I don't teach the kids class. So I don't want to take credit for, for what they've done, but those things make me happy because I do provide the vehicle for those things that happen. And I guess that's what I was kind of thinking as a generic term. I do like the fact that we have become part of the community. We're, we're part of the Charleston community. The, uh, the mayor works out with us and um, people contact us all the time. I'm friends with everybody in the news, every, every outlet, not because it, it's, it helps me. I don't even try to get on this stuff. It's just, we're part of the community now. Like, so people know my wife and I, and it feels good that we can go out and help people. Right. And that's we beautiful. help them when we can. Let's say, say it again. That's, that's beautiful. Yeah, it is. Right. And then, and that's what made me feel like this, because I don't like look at my gym as a job, right? Because I have another job. You, you guys have other jobs, right? And so the day I've always said the day that I start looking at it as a job, that's the day that I'm not going to be happy, right? right? And so, and I'm not going to say that I haven't, there's been days I don't want to go to the gym. I'm just wore out and I've got to teach that night. But also what Ashley said, that's what's why I'm still in jujitsu. And I'm thankful through those days, because if it wasn't for those days, maybe I would disappear. Maybe I would be that guy that just fell into a rut. And, and because of that, I'm there. But also because of that, since we've had a gym in Charleston so long, we're a staple of the community. Like, and, and now, now that I've gotten older, that's what we do. We donate, we do workout events outside. I try to help people. I do what I can. And that's, I you guess, do yourself, the, you know, con, you know, you, you do uh, uh, free self-defense classes. You do all sorts of stuff, but yeah. I mean, and you, you, you are unquestionably a staple of Charleston. Yeah. And, and, and it makes me happy because it really does not. And that's the thing, even all that stuff at the beginning, I was worried that it was almost like Gary said, like self-indulgent, right? Because you can't deny that getting out on TV and doing stuff is going to send people to your gym, right? And then I was almost concerned that people are going to be like, well, maybe he's doing this because of this. And then I was like, why do I care? It, it doesn't matter. I know why <laughs> I'm doing it. And then, and the people that meet me, they, they understand like, man, like, because sometimes too, like when people like another, let's say a karate gym locally, because there's not like a whole bunch of other jujitsu gyms, but definitely karate, like they'd be like, that guy's an asshole. They have this story, right? And then people would meet me and they're like, you're not an asshole. I'm like, well, that's nice of you to say. Or <laughs> like, you know, I was like, wait. <laughs> like, well, I've heard all this other stuff about you, and I was like, ah, well, that's sad. <laughs> you know, like, I'm sorry. And but anyway, like that was nice. But I also thinking of all that though. If I go back to myself, and I did write this down while you guys are talking, I would also say that's one of the things that I'm proud of, and it's kind of a weird thing to be proud of. I am proud of the growth that all of this sport has actually changed me. Like I can remember being young. And almost not liking you, Ashley. I didn't, I never did not like you, but I'm just saying, like, you looked at everybody like competition. So I was kind of like standoffish. And I do regret that. That's what I think of as an older man, like, in only 44. But I think, man, I missed all these years where Ashley and I could have been friends or all these like, more friends, like, that we are now. And it, it's, it's like a different, like, now I feel I have a better camaraderie with everybody else that does jujitsu. Maybe some of it's because we have tournaments now and I get to hang out with people and that changed things, right? And everybody, like, and that's and just for example, like the last tournament we had, like, and I got a ton of emails, like that's what people love is the fact that two people are getting on the mat ready to murder each other, essentially, right? <laughs> but at the same time, like their gyms are hanging out, people are hugging, people are talking, they're like, I'll see you next time. Hey, let me get your phone number. Let's train sometime. Let's cross, you know, like things have changed. Like it's a different thing. And that's what, what I love. And, I, and it's almost like to say that I'm most proud of that is, is not the right statement because I have nothing to do with that, but I am proud of us as a community, not me. And I have nothing to do with that. What I do have to do with is maturity, right? That I've finally come to grips with accepting us all as a community, right? That I am thankful for part of this community. And it's, it is awesome. And like, and then to speak, like we're sitting here all three talking and I realize how similar all three of us are. And I, you know, it, it's amazing, right? We, we kind of think the same way. And like you joked about it, on Instagram that we just become best friends, but like we, we we're all pretty similar. Like it is kind of funny. Like when you talk, it's like hearing Gary talk or like hearing me talk, we have a, a similar outlook and we talk kind of a similar way. And it, that is awesome. Like that, that's what I'm proud of is just being part of, of, you know, a community and friendships like you guys. And, um, you know, and hopefully I can continue to do it. Like as I've grown from, I don't, you know, I was 18, 19 when I started this, like you guys, and now, you know, I'm 44. So hopefully by the time I'm 60, 
I'll be way smarter. <laughs> like something else <laughs> will happen. I don't know what it'll be, but maybe I'll be throwing holograms like Star Wars at people and talking to them, except, you know, like it's, it's, I'm just thankful for all that. So maybe it's not exactly the greatest answer for like you guys. You guys had a better answer, than me, but, um, yeah, I'm proud and thankful of, of, of your friendship too, I guess, is, is the thing. You guys are awesome, man. So it's, it is good. Well, I appreciate that. And Butch, let me, let me chime in here on a couple of things. Um, number one, hats off to you for putting on the West Virginia games, because prior to you, there was nothing of the sort. There was no unified, accepted West Virginia games. You know, you put that together out of whole cloth you made that hats off to you and that is no easy task that is no easy task i'm sure no it's uh, not well thank you and uh it, the, the hardest and, and everybody to needs to acknowledge that butch Hiles deserves unbelievable credit for taking the time year after year and putting that on uh, because it does a lot of people a lot of good and it is got to be a giant pain in your ass it is with having a, just like you it is with having another job right like when you and gary was by the way all over the place on the mats too yeah uh, well that, that, that is a good point and i don't you know that's the other thing like so when uh, somebody thanks me which we have gary and all the guys that help. I mean, it is a team effort, right? And that's, and, and I couldn't because I have a real job and all this other stuff and to try to put that on on top of it and make it what it is, is as good as we can make it, right? Like we're not Naga or that's not my job, right? Like, I, so I don't, not having these high paid referees come around, not having, the, there's going to be some mistakes. There's going to be some hiccups, right? But we hopefully try to make it right. And, but, but I do think people get it now. I think at the beginning, you know, some people are like, were you know they didn't know what to under, under they didn't know what it was right and now that's what i'm saying like people are really happy now like even when there's a i think it was gary came over right and you were asking me about a i think it was you right You're asking me about, oh, i 100 percent. i'm pretty sure I, okay now all we have, things we aside, I'm about to figure this out for us. <laughs> no no i'm exercising my demons now okay there was a match that i ref and i messed up uh -oh. <laughs> really uh -oh. So it's your guy, Ashley. So just I 100% messed up, and I am guilty, and I am sorry, and I have felt bad about it, and I've done <laughs> push-ups, and I've reflected, and I know that I'm a better person today because I screwed up so bad. It wasn't a huge mess up, but I thought there was a scramble in a, in the midst of a takedown. I thought a guy went to turtle. I thought he still had the leg. He didn't. The guy went around. I don't know if I got distracted. Being a ref sucks. I don't ever. Oh, it's a want... nightmare. It's the it's worst. A nightmare. And so I am sorry to the guy. That all being said, it washed out because they were they both ended up in the loser bracket. Neither one of them ended up meddling. So thank God for that. Didn't it wasn't like a <laughs> it wasn't it wasn't a gold medal mistake. But still, I feel terrible about it. But like like Butch was saying, like there are going to be mistakes. And I talked to the guy afterwards and Butch was ready to run it back. Hey, we can run it again and get it going. But it, it really is. It should be like a whole part of me being a Butch Heil student and a whole part of me being uh, a part of like tr wanting to be a part of the WVGO is the fact that Butch is there for the guys. It's not about him. And it's not about, Really, I mean, WVGO puts it on, but it's not about WVGO. It's about showcasing people and letting people get the opportunity to present their jujitsu and present their sport the way that they know it. And that, uh, you know, I, I was under Helsing Gracie Gym. I left for my reasons and, and I was in limbo for a little bit, but I had already formed a bond with Butch because. Which Helsing Gracie Gym were you at before? In, in Athens, I had started under a blue belt uh, in Athens, and uh, uh, he was a student of uh, Robin Giesler up in Columbus, and uh, he had brought jujitsu, and thankfully, thank God, he brought jujitsu to Athens, Ohio, because then I started doing jujitsu, and, uh, and, and so I was under him, and then I was in limbo for about, after eight or so years of doing jujitsu, I was in limbo, and then I... I had, like I said, I was heavy competitor. I was competing in all of Dustin's uh, AGCs and 
Yeah. Uh, at, at the time, it was a higher grappling championship, but then it turned into AGC. So I was competing there. I was competing at all of the Nagas, whatever they would come close. If IBJJF ever showed their face at the time, uh, there was no I- IBJJF in, in Ohio. Um, they finally came to Cincinnati, and then I jumped on the chance to go to that. Um, did World Masters, uh, and then a ton of WVGOs. And when I, I was doing, I was consistently doing WVGOs. And the whole thing about me coming to Butch was Butch was putting it on. It wasn't for him. And he would come and talk to the guys. If you were, if you were a good competitor and you had a good showing, he would come over and say, hey, man, I like what you're doing. You're doing a really good job. Nobody, nobody else was really coming up to me and saying, I was like, damn, I feel kind of special. And then I get featured, you know, I was lucky enough to be featured on fight to win. And, and that's a big thanks to Dustin oh. Ware because had it not been for Dustin Ware, I wouldn't have had that opportunity. And so it, that's the beautiful thing about jujitsu is like these guys who are running these smaller competitions, they are catapults to the bigger thing, you know? And, and, and I appreciate, I appreciated that. I appreciate Dustin saying, Hey, you know, I've got Gary Hashman, who's my purple belt. Uh, heavyweight champion and Ohio state champion. And, you know, uh, when, when, uh, when uh, fight to win came to Cleveland, my name was put out there because of it, you know, had it not been for Butch, I, you know, coming over to me, who's to say that I would still be doing jujitsu. You know, really? do you think that's a pivotal, do you think that's a pivotal point for you? I think, I, I definitely think it's all, uh, those are everything. Uh, everything is a pivotal point. I can't say that one thing kept me or left me, you know, but it was just the gratitude. Dustin had always been grateful for me competing. Butch had always been grateful for me competing. These guys seeing, saying, Hey man, I like what you're doing. You seem passionate about the sport. Keep doing it. And it, that motivated me to go to the next competition. What was, uh, do you have any pivotal points? Like points where you had to decide, do I I'll continue you, at the level I I'm may have, at now? Or I may have, I, ta- I may have talked point. about it on here before, but I will always say that there was one submission that I got in my okay. entire jiu-jitsu journey that kept me in it. When I started jiu-jitsu, I was 270 pounds. I was way overweight. Wow. Me and my wife, okay. yeah, I was a big guy. Me and my wife were talking about having our second kid. And I was thinking to myself, man, I'm really out of shape. I don't know if I can keep up with a toddler. I need to get into shape. I found jujitsu. Long story short, I, I get into jujitsu. My main training partner is also about 270 pounds, but the good 270. He's Ooh. six, six, four shred, shredded. And I was the other big guy. So I got beat up on for a solid eight months. It was just me getting ragdolled. And it was probably the best thing for my jujitsu because it made me, I had to really get defensive and had to have good defense before I could start implementing offense. And he had taken a leave. He was in the military um, and he had left and he was, he was already experienced in jujitsu when I had started, but he had left and he had come back. And when he had come back, um, was it a different game then? I, well, he was gone for about three to four months. And in that time, I had done a lot of competitions and I think I, I am still an at, I, I am still a strong believer that com- competition is your biggest growth. One competition is 10 classes. Like, I think it has, it has the same, has the same effect of 10 classes. And I did a lot of competitions in that, that three to four months that he was gone. He came back. And I had, I had gone from 270. And at this point I was probably maybe 190 pounds, 195 Holy pounds. Shit. Yeah. I've lost oh, a sorry, ton of weight. I don't know if we're allowed to say that. On we are 100% good. <laughs> so I had lost, I'd lost anywhere from 70 to 80 pounds at that point. Now I've ballooned back up because I don't compete anymore and there's no reason to run. So I don't, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but I was competing at 195, 100, uh, 200 pounds um, regularly. And he when he came back, he was still the same guy that he was when he left. And um, so he's 260, 270, but solid. I mean, he looks like the rock. If Mr. Clean was on 
on some good Mexican supplements. That's who he looked like. And uh, so uh, I, I remember I was able to get back to guard and I caught him at Kimura. Now, Kimura is one of those things that like you have to have patience if it's a bigger, stronger guy. But I had the Kimura locked up and I was a blue belt at the time. I had the Kimura locked up and I was waiting and then I would wiggle a little bit and I was able to squeeze his arm just a little bit past like he was, you know, grabbing the inside of his thigh. And I was able to bring it a little bit further across the, the top of the thigh. Across little, the threshold, man. Uh, yeah. And so we're getting closer and closer. And finally, I get to clear from his, from his knee. It goes past. And he tapped. That, still to this day, that tap is the most important tap of all of my jujitsu. I would be, unless... I go on to do some sort of crazy ADCC at 43 years old, which it'll probably never happen. But if that happens, maybe I'll find a tap that's more important to my jujitsu journey. But that tap is what kept me in jujitsu because I, every day it was like, he was my litmus test. I would come in and be like, okay, I'm not going to get tapped six times today in a five minute round. Okay. I'm not going to get tapped four times today in this five minute round. Two months later, I'm not going to get tapped today. And when I didn't get tapped, I was like, oh, man, I'm really getting good. And then when it got to the point where I'm actually tapping him, I forget about it. This, I know this works now, and there's no way anybody is ever going to stop me from doing this. That's so beautiful. That was the thing that, it, and that, I still think that, that was not eight years ago now. I still think of, I still think about that. Like it was yesterday. I can't, I went home. I remember going home. I didn't say, and obviously we don't kiss and tell on the mat. So if you tap somebody at practice or whatever, you don't, it's not a ah, celebration. I want a gold medal kind of thing. So I didn't say anything that that night but when I got in my car, it was a 20 minute drive home. I called my wife immediately. I was like, babe, I tapped. Him. I got big. I hit him with a Kimura and I, all the way home and i was like smiling now, did, did she appreciate what you were saying of course she didn't <laughs> <laughs> it didn't mean anything to her but i was on cloud nine for three days after that that's awesome <laughs> that is great so it, not, to, not that that was a good stretch i just wanted to mention this because gary mcconaughey said hey that was cyborg mike match he wrote this on instagram do you know who that is ashley cyborg mike I know Cyborg Mike. So that was the match that started all this, apparently, I guess. So, so anyway. <laughs> okay. like, but it just to finish that, I know we got off in, a, in actually a beautiful thing, but I, what I wanted to finish that whole story with at the beginning was Gary came over to me. Again, there's going to be a mistake, and he was describing his point of view. And I said, well, sure, that sounds great. Whatever you did sounds great. And then Tim came over and described his point of view. And I said, well, then I have no fucking idea what's going on. Like, but what I wanted to say was Tim was amazing. Wouldn't you agree, Gary? Absolutely. Absolutely. He, 100%. He, he definitely came from a point of view that was like, we all make mistakes. I want you to know that you made the mistake. Look yes. for it the next time. It's not, it, it, and like I said, it ended up, thankfully, it did, it washed out. It wasn't a gold medal mistake. But, and I think, I think that's kind of the thing is like, we all, we all make mistakes. I still make Absolutely. mistakes. Well, then, you know? And that's what I want to say. Well, that's and the way I describe it to my students is if you got, if you feel like you got gypped by a ref, it's really your fault. Yeah. Okay. Because same. you made it questionable. Your yeah. failure to act or failure to respond or failure to exercise what needed to be done at the right time allowed the situation to occur which allowed this referee to somehow make a what would be a questionable call yeah it, no, it, it, and, and so i encouraged my students it's your fault if you don't win it's your fault yeah. and i don't mean that in a bad way but it's an accountability sort of way yeah. and i encourage people always loss is good loss should be embraced yeah. you know if you lose you should learn from that and you should learn multiple lessons from a loss and you, in your case go ahead but 
I was going to say, I'll tell you another good story. This was, this was back when we you had the West Virginia games outside. And I'm not going to say who it was. It was one of In Ash- the tent. Yes, it was one of Ashley's students. And I don't know, again, it was like people are running up to me saying something happened, and I don't remember. But I know Ashley came to me separately. It was one of his guys. And he said, fuck it, I want him to lose. Because I was ready to say exactly <laughs> what you just – I was going to be like, I want – go ahead, go do it again. I don't know what happened, but if they wanted to go ahead and do it again, you know – and Ashley said, no, I want him to lose. He's too cocky. And I was like, fuck, <laughs> I don't even know. Like, that's crazy, right? But that, that's what you're saying right now. Like you, and you said, you expanded upon it. I don't remember the exact words, but he, you're like, he needs to learn from this. He thinks he's getting too good. He needs to learn from this. So I want him to take the loss. Well, I, I want to tell you, yeah. all my guys, absolutely. Listen, don't leave it up to the referees and you should finish things. And don't, don't give it, don't give the option of the referee having the option to give it to somebody else. And Ashley, I was 100% wrong. I couldn't have been more wrong in my entire life. And it happens. C- Cyborg Mike, you can hate me. I deserve it. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I made a mistake and I own it. But I, well, let I me tell you, you Cyborg, Cyborg Mike is an absolute gentleman. And he would, I, I, I'm certain I speak for him when I say it's okay. Because well, he would never, never be hostile about that. Yeah. And, and he, that's he would wanna, accept that he, he screwed up somehow. And that's what I want. That is the beauty. That, and that, I guess this kind of goes with what I'm most proud of. Like when that tournament started, things like that were like, I almost used to think that because you ever watch Brazilians at tournaments right like for example I did a tournament in uh, Akron Ohio way back when like way back Salo was there the real Salo right and he had a bunch of people in he was yelling the entire time ah, da, 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 half the time in Portuguese right in Portuguese yes yeah. and I had like another girl there that was like tell this guy to shut the fuck up and she was getting mad because she was like doing something for me like ra- like <laughs> scoring or something and she was like I'm gonna fucking hit this guy if you don't show, you know, and he would go over and yell at her like that ref, this, they don't know, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, then I had, like, I told her, I said, hey, that this is like Solo. He'll kill you. You need to shut up. You know, like he'll kill us all. He's Probably people. when he was world champion. He, he's exactly when he was world champion. So I was like, just call like, we're blessed that he's there. Just be quiet. But he came over to me separately. He said, this is how Brazilians are. It's all, I'm not mad. This is how we are. Like we, if we're not yelling, it's not a good tournament. Like he was fine. Right. But. <laughs> But like, I thought like they understood that, but I thought a lot of the Americans took that and they were just yell the entire time. They complain about everything, right? So I remember like first couple of terms, it was just a lot of complaining like for nothing, like for stupid stuff. And I don't know if it's some of the tournament or, you know, some of the things have gotten better also too. Like, you know, we kind of, kind of constantly make changes too. If things were going good, we got rid of refs, we changed some things, but just the way, like I said, that's what I want to say. Like the way that everybody handled that was be- that that actually made me really happy. Like just sitting there because, you know, I've known Tim for a long time too. Tim's been a smart ass sometimes. I remember the best speech I ever saw in the history for me that I thought was hilarious was when George Grigel gave Tim Dunlap his black belt and you guys posted that video. And they said like, every gym's got an asshole and here's our asshole. And it was just this, like, and I was like, that is so fucking funny, right? Cause it is kind of true and not talking about him cause I don't know, but I have the same people in my gym that were like, people like just don't like him or whatever. I don't, and I'm not saying that about Tim cause I don't know this, the background but the story was fantastic. And it was about Tim and, and all of us have been smart asses, right? I've seen Tim be a smart ass, but I'm just thinking in years past, Tim would not have been what he was now. And maybe it's cause he's nicer. Maybe it's cause the environment, but he was just like, like he started to kind of argue with you, Gary. And then he's like, look, I don't care. He's like, fine. You made a mistake. I don't care. He's like, it uh, happens. Right. He like, was, and I was like, that's awesome. Like, I watched it back. <laughs> and I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you now I'll that I'm going to carry video. that with yeah. me. I'm, I'm going to carry it with me for a while because I don't, I don't really like being wrong. And I was wrong. <laughs> well, that's good. I forgot. So that's a good point. Gary taped all this and we'll, we'll, we'll put it on YouTube later. He's got a bunch of matches on tape and we're going to work on it. But, uh, but that's awesome. But that's another thing. Like, so every time something happens so for all of us, it's like a learning experience, right? Like Gary's going to learn from that. I learned from that in that match. It is what it is. We're all fine with that, you know, but like you said, that's why the beautiful thing about, I think these local tournaments is that we know it's a local tournament, right? And they're, they're there to feature each other. And it's beautiful seeing like people, 
like sell it. you know the only thing that hurts my feelings i guess in a way it doesn't hurt my feelings but like my sons were competing and i just felt like i couldn't coach them because i had to be indifferent right and i did actually go coach one of them because my uh my coaches were busy and they didn't see my son competing and he was it was funny because he was like mounted just sitting there and i like walked over it's like cole get up and he literally just pushed the guy off and got up i was like oh man if somebody's coaching him it'd have been great you know but that's the only regrets I ever have in the tournaments is just my guys kind of get the shafts because I can't say nothing, right? Like, I'm like, hey, I run this tournament. Like, if I'm starting to coach you, everybody's going to be like, hey, he's biased, right? And um, and that's fine. They're, they're all so good with it. Like, they know. I'm like, look, you're not going to get coached. You're going to kind of get the short end. Anytime there's a question. Do, they, do your students get coached by other people? Say, well, Gary was on the mat as a ref, yeah. but do you have – other assistant instructors that kick in sadly not like they do for the kids so everybody waits until the and they coach the kids and as soon as the kids are over all of our higher belts go out there and and then ref right so a lot of times they now they have somebody over there but it's not like you know somebody higher belt like actually can tell them what's going on and they just get forgot and then i think people are not used to coaching so they just sit there like a lot of times i'll say hey like ethan's out there go yell go like tell him what to do and they're like, oh, okay. Like, you know, it's like it doesn't even cross their mind, right? Which is fine. Like, it doesn't, I, I'm just, I feel sad for them in a weird way because that's another bonding experience that you have with your team. And I feel like they, they miss that in a way. But they also, on the plus side, we don't have a ton of adults competing on our, we have more, more kids that compete, right? Like, for whatever reason, we, you know, like most of our guys, I, I think they're pretty cool guys. Like, they understand, like, hey, this is a tournament. I want to help ref. I want to help with the tournament. So like we have a team of people, even from my wife's class, which is the kickboxing class, like there's a bunch of girls there, like asking what to do. Like, can I run brackets? And they're so nice. I mean, so nice. Like people, like I vol like I give, I'll give them anything. I, you know, I just take them out to dinner and that's not all I'm offering. I'm like, hey, can I give you money? What can I do? And everybody's like, no, I just want to help. And, but that is the other beautiful thing. People, they truly want to. They like see that they're doing something good. And even if they don't do jujitsu, like those girls that do kickboxing, they don't they don't know it's like me talking about deer hunting i don't know but they look they, they know we're really happy so they want to be part of it they're like I, I, I want to watch these guys roll around i have no idea what they're doing it looks really homosexual but they're really happy <laughs> so like well, what can i do to help you know and, and i kind of want to give a shout out to those guys like they, and i i know for me in nelsonville zach umbertson was huge Absolutely. in keeping yeah. things going and and i i know i'm sure i'm leaving people out but yep. like Zach stepped up, Zach stepped up and, and he was like, Hey, I've, I've been doing this competition, you know, for the last, you know, as long as I've been doing jujitsu and I just want to give back. And those guys are so important. It's like you said, it's just constantly giving back to the community, to the jujitsu community. If it wasn't for those guys, it would be hard for us to keep going forward, you know, especially in smaller, smaller venues, like, like West Virginia, you know, it, and I felt the same way in Southeast Ohio. It's like it, Columbus is a big enough area. They've got enough interest. Cincinnati, Cleveland, those are big cities. Athens, Ohio is small. Yeah, we've got a college, but when the college is out, we barely have 10,000 people in Athens County. You know? <laughs> so, and that's a devil for a club in that area. And yeah. I know that from having started Ground Zero in Morgantown, that you will have people cycle through and you might get a freshman. Let's say you get a freshman that comes in. You got them for four years. Four years. Yeah. And then they're out. And yeah. you cycle again. And you cycle again. And it's very tough to get the local people to be the staples of your gym. Hey, do you observe that or have you observed that so far? Absolutely. And, and, and I'm sure, you know, where I was at originally at Helsin Gracie, um, I'm sure that they felt the same thing. Trying to get the locals is the important thing, but you would, most of the people who want to do jujitsu and do jujitsu regularly and ju do jujitsu competitively, those guys, they're going to be younger males. You're, you're looking for the 14 to 25 year old guys that are, that are wanting to do that competitively. Um, not necessarily like, uh, recreational. And those guys, we get them when they're 19, 20, 21. I worked with the Ohio University MMA club and all of those guys, it was two, three years and then they were gone. 
you know, and, and it's not to say that they're doing so hard, but you have to accept that as part of it. That, and that's the you know, thing. When that you is... live in a college town, when you have a college environment, that's a, that is a permanent element of your existence. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that was a big thing like that coming. Uh, it was rough because I had uh, working with the Ohio University uh, MMA club. We had one guy. Uh, well, they have an say, MMA club? At, at Ohio University. Yeah. They actually... Um, so NUCA, which is, I don't even know what the acronym is, but if there was an NCAA for MMA, that's what NUCA is. And, <laughs> and uh, actually the guy who was kind of like the headline guy was um, the, the striking coach for Conor McGregor. And he was trying to start this up in the United States. So it was, it was kind of a big deal for all these college yeah, kids. Yeah, i and so uh, three of my guys ended up, they, they also had fights. So they had MMA fights down in Florida. They traveled to Florida. They did the whole deal. Um, went, and essentially it was an exhibition match, but they went down there, had a good time, came home with a lot of experience. And uh, it, it's kind of the same thing. Like you know, MMA club for a college that, I mean, not as groundbreaking as, as starting jiu-jitsu in 1994, 1995, but it's still, I mean, it's still probably, as far as college clubs go, it's a pretty new thing. And so it was nice to be a part of that and see those guys grow. But like you said, I, at best, I get four years with those guys. And after those well, four years, yeah. they're, they're going on with life. And, and I live in Huntington area and Huntington has Marshall University. We have a tremendous number of college kids roll through. Still have the same issue that we had in Morgantown, the same issue that you have, uh, that we don't have, you know, it, it, we do have, fortunately, since Huntington is a, an established metropolitan area, I suppose, we do have and have developed over time uh, the, the very fortunate benefit of having a number of people that were locals develop roots and stay with the club. And I encourage you to, you know, your locals that get with your club, stay with your club, try and encourage them as much as you can, because it very much helps the club because the, the more they can shoulder as they get more progressed in jujitsu, the less you have to shoulder. Well, uh, and, and at this point, you know, I'm very fortunate in that I've got probably, I don't know, I don't know how many black belts I've got in my gym, but a lot. I've got eight, nine black belts on any night. There's always, always a black belt that teaches our jujitsu classes, even the kids' class. And it's because we were a, fortunately able to develop locals, and I encourage you to do the same thing. Uh, you know, to develop your locals. The sad thing, what I was going to say is, and then Gary just moved North Carolina, so he's going to have to find somebody eventually to take that over, which is even harder, right? Because now he's, he's I don't know if you're exactly splitting your time, but you're still trying to keep the club running and figure out who's going to take it over. And it's hard, right? Because just like we, we started this whole podcast off with, is finding that de facto guy. And maybe that de facto guy's not in the group. We hope he is. Right. But it doesn't matter. Like you might get five guys together and then one of them doesn't necessarily got like all of, one of like we were the guys that stepped up. Right. But that doesn't mean that's going to happen. Right. And, and, and we hope it does. But, I, you know, that's the reality of the situation, man. It's tough. And I know those guys, they're awesome. So I hope that they do. But it's not in everybody's cards, man. Like as a college student. Right. And you're start, trying to start your life, too. That's a lot to handle. Um, you know, and maybe, you know, it doesn't, I don't know what goes on in everybody's head, right? Like, I don't know. It's weird. When I look back, I don't know why jujitsu meant so much to me that I was like, oh, I'll just keep this going. Right. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, that's an, that's an interesting thing to look back on because, because I'm thankful. Right. But it's the same thing. Like I started my, just for example, I started my job in radiology. I did x-ray and MRI. Somebody, and people ask me all the time, how'd you get into that? I have no fucking idea. 
I think I got an x-ray one time and I thought, well, hell, that looks easy. You just hit a button. I'll do that. Right? So, but I have no good story. So it's almost the same with jujitsu. It's like I did it. And then all of a sudden I have a gym. Like there's no good story, but I'm thankful I'm here. Just like my job. I'm thankful I'm here. Like I'm, you know, I'm in scrubs now. I'm thankful, I'm thankful it all worked out. Like it's a, it's a mystery. And maybe that's part of the the beauty of me is that I am so dumb and dunce that I don't look at things, right? Like it just happens. I'm kind of like, do you ever gump. feel like Butch that you forced gumped your way into life? I do. That's <laughs> like, I have no earthly idea how I got here. I, I live on some shrimp boat or somehow or something. Right? Like, I don't know. I do. I don't know yeah. how they all ended up here. How yeah. am I a lawyer? How am yes. I a third I degree black? Brazilian jiu-jitsu how the hell did this happen yeah it, 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 we have no earthly ideal right and uh but i maybe you know that's the funny thing maybe that's the beauty that's why we love forrest gump he doesn't know why any of that happened to like no, every- he just went in did his best in whatever situation he was in and shit worked out yes. you know yeah. here we are three four yeah gump, you know? I, I, there is a forrest gump element to life i truly believe that too but yeah. if you go in and you do your best at whatever it is you're doing, you know, things are, you're generally going to land on your feet. Yeah. That's generally going to happen. Speaking of landing on your feet, I wanted to think, I was thinking about this while we were talking. I like, guess so my mind goes everywhere. Maybe I'm ADD or brain damage from getting punched when I used to box, but <laughs> I was thinking about this. Um, also, because I was thinking about the podcast. So they remember, you guys know of the legendary Hicks and Gracie yoji and joe closed door match right he brought it up right and he's got the videotape he's going to release it so you know i don't want to ruin this podcast. is he gonna release it did he say he is that he is he, but he also said the reason he hasn't because it's nothing he said i literally just beat him up just, he's like there's not i take him he's like i take him down i punch him in the face it's not much to see so he's like he's like you guys will be disappointed you know um <laughs> well, but, he did but, we still want to see it, but apparently he's going to have a next Netflix movie come out within the next year, and really? so maybe he, he will put it on that. So yeah, so it's cool. That's it's awesome. I think that's for jujitsu guys. That's what we want more Hicks and Gracie, right? For us old school people. Um, but what made me think of that, or think of something similar to that, is I remember talking to Ashley, maybe a decade ago, and he got in this bar fight with two guys. Okay. Am I right? <laughs> So is it two- uh, I don't, I, I don't know which fight you're talking. I got into several fights. Is there more than one? So I just remember, <laughs> I remember this one. I just remember because I remember I even called you. It was such a, it was such a legend. It was, it was to me, it was very close to the Hicks and Gracie fight. So I was like, I got to see this. There's no video, but I was like, hey Ashley, I heard you got in a fight at a bar, and then yes, I think two guys started a fight with you and you beat them up. But and afterwards, you're like, hey, like I just realized I need if I'm going to teach self-defense, I almost feel like I need to take people on concrete and show them how to do MMA because fighting on concrete is a different story. And I guess you said you shot a double leg, took him down, blah, blah, blah. I don't know. Does this ring a bell? I don't, you might have got it. It does. It does. A friend of mine who was a student of mine at the time, uh, this was way back, you know, when I just started ground zero in Huntington. I started ground zero in, in, in Morgantown. And then when I graduated law school, I came back to Huntington where my father was and I, you know, and I, my family was, and I started, you know, establishing my life down here. And I started, you know, uh, same situation, but I already knew how to teach. I already knew how to run a school because I did it up in Morgantown. I started ground zero in Huntington. And so I, I did that. And one of my students and I, who was one of my good friends at the time, uh, we, we trained a lot and he was he was actually very talented. I think his son trains at Sans Ego now, oh, but yeah. awesome. in, in any event, uh, he and I and our wives went out to uh, a bar in Huntington one night and I had known that this bar had issues. Uh, because I had represented people that had uh, been accused of drunken disorderly and had been accused of a lot of things and had been allegedly roughed up by the bar staff. And I also had a student of mine who was 
let's say he was kind of the king of the bartenders here in Huntington at the time. And he was just a Hulk. I mean, an absolute Hulk, his name. Well, actually, you beat him in one tournament. Now that I think about it, Butch, his name was, uh, we called him Billy Bob. Yeah, I mean, uh, he came to the Vanderlei Silva seminar, too, but he left because he was pissed there was too many people or something. But I, I do remember him, big, bald-headed guy. Oh, right? yes, yes, yeah. an absolute Hulk. And it was not, not, to, not that I want to call the business out, but because I, I might have another story after you're done. Is it the Mad Dog or something, Dog Saloon or something, like some of the dog name in it? Uh, there, 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 there is a, a wild dog. Uh, that might be it, actually. But I'll, I'll finish another story that's funny after yours. But I, if it's, I think it's the same place, actually. So, well, it, it, it is a different place, but uh, not far apart. Yeah, lots uh, of fights, right? There, there was a lot of fights, and the bartenders, of course, at that time, there was other jujitsu schools opening up in the area. And I was talking earlier about pissing on street corners. And that was kind of what was going on at the time. Nice. You know, uh, I was established in my school. There was other people who were dabbling in jujitsu, starting their school and stuff. And that was going on. And there was some of the people that were with bars and bar, you know, bar backs and, and and bouncers and anyway billy bob was one of the guys he was one of the notorious bouncers in our area but he was not working at this one particular bar but uh i went to this bar and my wife and the friend that i trained with and his wife um and we were getting into our cups we went uh and we called for a cab. This was later in the uh, later in the season. I'd say it was October or November. But we called for a cab, and the cab came. And I went out, and I was going to hail the cab. And you know, cabs there, okay. So I go to go back in, and the bartender's like, "You can't come back in. Do you have an? You know, I, I need another." seven or eight dollars for cover yeah i was like well i just i just walked past you i just you know i'm getting a cab my people are in here you know and things and he started giving me a bunch of static and i just said uh you know i i just need to get my wife in there and he was like no you're not going to get in there and with that he had a bunch of girls around him so he was puffing up and being and i'd already known that these guys were notorious for whipping people's asses outside i had represented a guy that got his ass beat outside they when they were outside all the bouncers surrounded him and jumped him and beat the shit out of him and then called the cops and then the cops charged him and so i knew i knew this from a couple of different occasions that this was going on i was like oh shit and so I just said, uh, you know what? It, and it, let, let me just give my no. I need it. I need money to get back in. And I was like, dude, I'm not going to pay you to get back in. And he said, well, you're not getting back in, motherfucker. I don't know what to tell you. And I just started like, all right, asshole. And so I, I stood outside and he was sit, standing outside on the sidewalk. And at that time, I just said, all right and i got up you know you said fuck up it. on the sidewalk and i was just like okay i'm not moving until and at that time some other girls took our cab and left and i was like well so what the right fuck <laughs> what the fuck now and so and he was like all right get the fuck down the road and i was like no nope, i'm on the sidewalk he said what do you mean i said i'm on the sidewalk i'm not going anywhere I was up in his face. I was like, you know, I'm not going anywhere. It's a public area. I'm going to stand right here till the next cab comes, motherfucker. And he's like, no, you got to move on. He's like, no, I don't. You know, I, I'm an attorney. I can go anywhere I want. I can go right here if I want. I can go over here if I want. I can go over here if I want. And I started pirouetting around him because he was such a fucking dickhead. And, and I just said, I can go anywhere I want. And I'm not touching him, but I'm like, I'm on the public sidewalk. I could do anything I want out here. And, you know, because he's just a goddamn dick. And 
<laughs> you know, I asked and, this story and, kid. <laughs> and, and then I was like, I'm just going to wait here. And with that, all the chicks are talking. So then he's like, all Barney fucking badass. And so then he starts, you know, talking to his people. I'm like, oh shit, here it comes. And with that, several other guys come out. And they're like, uh, you got to move on. And I was like, no, I'm not. And at that time, someone else had gone in and told my friend, uh, are you here with Ashley? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, they're giving him a hard time outside. And so he came outside. And this is kind of kind of not good on my part. I, I really kind of should have handled this better, but I didn't because I was getting embroiled in the situation and this asshole. And uh, he came outside and there's two or three bouncers and they start surrounding me, you know, just very slowly maneuvering around and I see what they're doing and I, I know what's going on. And based on what I had talked to from the other people, I know what's coming next. Coming next is where I get steamrolled and sucker punched. And this is how it goes. Well, my friend comes out and says, Ashley, they don't know who you are, do they? And with that, they were like, what are you talking about? And he said, they don't know, do they? And I said, no, no, they really don't know. They don't know. And that did nothing but infuriate them. Well, they, at that point, they continued to surround me. And when I was completely surrounded, I just picked the biggest one in the whole lot and just blasted him right in the face and blew his nose up. And with when he went down, I went and picked another one up and I took the next one that was available and just started me and him and taking him down. And I'm not exactly sure how everything went, but we went down on the ground. I'm knee on belly and I'm, uh, I'm punching him and then I'm mounting and I'm still blasting this guy. And I could feel someone pounding me on the back, which by the way, is a real problem in a street fight. You got to worry about your people's people, or, you know, your other your opponent's people you got to worry about that but that's stuff. also why i say like you said neon belly is the thing right so you could get up if you're fully mounted right you can't get up and test yeah right absolutely and i was neon belly at first but then naturally rolled in the mount and i'm just wearing this dude out and uh i feel someone kind of hit me from behind and you know long story short i had taken three guys and when i get back up my student had beaten up one guy and had the owner of the bar and an arm bar and he's he's he says i'm gonna break his goddamn arm man i'm gonna break his arm call him off call him off so the owner is calling off his bouncers and they go inside and then we finally let go and get up and walk down the road and i'll tell you what butch I've never been so lucky in my entire life, in my entire life, that could have gone so horribly wrong. But me and me and one other guy beat up five bouncers one night. Well, that's uh, well, four bouncers and an owner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's an epic story, and it's it, not as you were saying that I started remembering the phone call because I that I was, I was worried that wasn't going to be the same story. But as soon as you started saying, I was like, that is the story because because you're a good you're a good talker for one thing i actually uh, gary and a couple other guys are writing me while you're talking and there's they love the story they love uh, they love the stories you're saying and i do too by the way that was amazing so i'm so glad i asked that this probably made this podcast amazing just just that story <laughs> so, well let, let me let me put the addendum on to yeah. it uh I, I told uh billy bob who was the king of the bouncers of Huntington. I said, Billy Bob, I called him up that night. And I said, listen, I don't know who these sons of bitches are. I don't care who they are. I want every one of those motherfuckers to call me tomorrow. And I want an apology from every one of them or I'm going to fuck them up. I'm going to wreck <laughs> them. I swear to God, I'm going to fuck them up. And you just tell them, you tell them, I swear to God, I am. 
And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the next day, my phone's just off the hook. <laughs> scared. I'm sure there's. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, we had this misunderstanding. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Were you nicer when they called? Were you like, it's okay? Or were you like, you better, you're damn right, you're sorry? No, I was like, no, I really wasn't all that great about it, honestly. I was like, you guys really need to behave better. You know, I really wasn't doing anything wrong, and you all tried to gang rush me, yeah. and you tried to you tried to gang rush the wrong guy in the entire fucking state. You probably picked the wrong guy in the entire goddamn state <laughs> to try and beat up. And, and it was very fortunate that that was the occasion, yeah. but uh, you know, it worked. It worked out very well. In fact, when I got done, when we got done, when we split up and walked away. I had a white shirt that night and it was red. It was really freaking blood red. And, and I was like, oh my God. You know, when we got down the street, it's like, oh my God, I've been stabbed. Been stabbed. <laughs> and, and I had my wife check me and stuff and I was okay. It was just their blood, thank God. And I kept that shirt for a while. Uh, and then she finally the throw it away. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that shirt, that shirt should have been framed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought so too. Oh, I'm so mad at her for throwing that away. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's but it's a legend. And it's a great story for something like this, and for your st because I remember when we talked. Because I was just, I didn't hear all the details, but I was, I knew you won. Somebody told me about it, but I was still concerned. I was, I was making sure you're okay. That's why I called in. There was a time that you and I didn't really, we didn't talk like a whole bunch because there wasn't tournaments going on, right? It wasn't like, it wasn't normal. And I don't think cell phones were around that much either. Or even right. if they weren't, nobody really used them. So it was like, I, but I called you on a cell phone. So I know we had them. But anyway, like I called and yeah, and it was cool because I remember the story it was, it was, it was just like this. I was like, man, that's amazing. I was like, I was, I was all enthralled. And, and then you were like, yeah, my knees are all fucked up. Like, and that's oh, what you thought. You're like, yeah, like, I feel like I need to take my students out on like a cement pad. And so we, we can work different kind of stuff, you know, or, and I was like, man, that's a good thought. Like, absolutely. I swear to God, you try, you try jujitsu on cement. I yeah. swear to God, it'll change your opinion of the guard. It'll yeah. change your opinion of mount. <laughs> Very true. My, yeah. I mounted that dude. My, my knees were a disaster. I can't imagine trying to shoot or something like that. It was terrible. Jed here on the on the comment section said you should have made the bouncer sign that shirt and then framed it. <laughs> <laughs> An extra step. I like that, Jed. That's very, that's very nice. So I, I will tell you, it's almost like following Gary's story with with the girl that said that, like so. My story is not going to be as great because that was a great story. So I, and I don't have as many beautiful details. But what I wanted to I think it was the wild dog. If, and I don't know. I just know there's a dog in the name, but. So my original trainer who, who started me with jujitsu and, and then really was boxing kickboxing is Leon Ramsey. He's the head of the athletic commission in West Virginia now, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So we, we were training and we had um, at the time we had George Randolph who fought in pride too. Uh, he, he fought a kickboxing match, but I mean, and George was awesome. But um, so anyways, it was, it was George and Channing Tatum, the actor and some other people went to that wild dog saloon, right. In Huntington. So here's the kind of funny story. So Channing Tatum and, you know, I don't know. Maybe I shouldn't say all this stuff, but it, because in case, you know, I don't know. It's just, allegedly, you know, allegedly. Like is, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, it may not have been Channing. To the best of your recollection. <laughs> yeah. So, so any, he go, he goes in. It's and he um, bumps into a guy uh, who happens to be a black guy and calls him a racist name, right? Um, so that guy calls all his friends and they wait outside. So when George and Channing come back out, there's about 15 to 20 black guys waiting for him. And they're going to beat their ass for them calling them a racist name. My friend George has no idea this is going on. So, and he's the pride fighter, right? He has no clue. Literally, he was just in the bar hanging out. So they come out. And then all of a sudden, it was just pandemonium. They're getting their heads knocked in, beaten up, just destroyed. Um, Channing is, uh, literally crawls under a car and hides but <laughs> but i'm also not making fun it's 15 verse 2 so it's not it's not like well, I, <laughs> yeah so it's not and so even my friend george who's in pride too, he got beat up too but we, he before he got beat up he would he backed up against a van and originally so he they couldn't surround him which is 
ingenious, right? Like if we're looking at all these scenarios and street fighting, these like I learned from you and him and we all learn. So he backs up and they're coming at him like one or two at a time. So he's just literally tie clinching them. Boom, knee, he's six, seven, 280. So when he knees you, it's, it just takes one knee. So he's just dropping them, boom, boom. And they're like, holy shit, we can't take this guy. You know, well, the other one's underneath the car. So he, he's fine, right? <laughs> and, uh, eventually they get smart enough to know like, okay, like no more of this one or two at a time. They just took the remaining 10. Just and bum went, rush him. Yeah, so then he got his ass kicked too. And he was able to get in a car, of, I think maybe that same van. I don't even think it was his. And because um, why would my friends be driving a van? Let's, you know, I'm not going to, you know, we don't drive vans. We're not trying to pick up any little kids or nothing. But, but anyways, he crawls in. He's, <laughs> he's okay. But I mean, they got the crap beat out of him. And it, now it wasn't the bounce. It, that, that bar had the same exact, there was like nonstop fights. And, to that fact, it was their fault. Like, right, they started the fight. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's 15 versus two, you shouldn't, there's no reason to do that, right? Like whatever he did, but right. it's an interesting story because of who it was. And and that was the time like, um, to, to kind of expand upon that story is, is funny because Channing went to Glenville State, that was 1998, played football mm -hmm. there. And um, he trained with all of us there at Leon's. And um, it's funny because he took first place. And you, you ever, so when you mentioned where me and Billy Bob had competed, it was the same tournament. Tim Dunlap was in, Dustin Ware was an AKJU, it stands for American Karate right. Unit, right? Do you, do you know those, Gary? They come from Ohio. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah and that's where we, all, that's actually why I started my tournament. Because the only thing you had was at AKJU and the rules were jacked up because it was a karate tournament. They would just put out a mat the size it was like a nine by ten and whoever you know what i mean so it could have lasted all day and it was like it was awful they didn't know how to grapple but they had a grappling tournament so when jujitsu guys showed up like and they also we, didn't know how to ref either absolutely. so i mean it was equally balanced yeah so in, in all fairness i apparently don't know how to ref either so oh. let's not shit on those guys <laughs> it all works it all works out in the end no it so anyway, yeah, so we, yeah, we we're all in that tournament. And, um, but anyway, so yeah, so they trained the uh, Channing for this tournament, right? Never did karate. So this is, so the, the kind of the kicker of that story is that obviously we're all complaining as jujitsu guys, cause they didn't know jujitsu. We'd still go there cause that was the only thing. So he joined the karate portion Channing Tatum did. And so, but he could do like a standing backflip. He's like a good athlete, right? So he would, he would do that. So they taught him like a bullshit kata. It wasn't even real. They would just teach you <laughs> and then he would just make these weird hand motions and go, ha, ah, yeah, like just random. So he took first place in the kata stuff. Like that's how bull crap that. And, and again, I'm sorry. Cause I like those guys. I do like Don Madden and everybody is I like, I Don like Madden. It. That's exactly I, like, who it was. But yeah. So I'm not, I, I apologize profusely because it sounds like I'm talking shit and I probably am, but, but I like you guys. I'm just saying he did. It was not even, it was not karate. He just did a backflip threw his hands around the air and yelled, ha, huh? and he took, yeah! yeah, he took first place in the national. He had a giant, giant, I still have the pictures to this day of, of him holding up that trophy with Leon and George and all those guys. So it's, it's hilarious. Anyway, and those are stories like I'll bring up a lot of time. I'm like, Hey, you want to hear a funny story? It's, it's very similar to yours. Like it, it just, it cracks me up because that's what I think of the times that we came from. That was probably 1998 for sure. I, I'm no, I know for sure it was 98 because there was no jujitsu tournaments. Like, no, not there was no such thing as a naga. No, so you know, I mean, none of that stuff was around back then. Like, we are all. I ran into so many people at those AKJUs. Like, that's what there was. And I remember when the, then when naga did come out, they were only in like New York or so. You know, like these big giant cities. Because I remember when we talked earlier, like uh, when I trained Jason Walls, he went to one of them to compete, but he yeah. had to go way to like new york or something and i was like well who are these people paying airfare and food and hotel and entry fee to do jiu-jitsu tournament i'll just go down the road for 25 bucks like it seems a lot easier you know what i mean like it, it seemed a little crazy to me at the time but but people don't understand what it was like in 98 because i also in 98 and that's what I, a lot of stories i was to tell people i was taking seminars from blue belts probably in 98 like literally i took one from uh Paul Creighton, who's a black belt under Henzo. Um, another guy that's, I don't know, he's under Solo. Like, you know, I mean, they're blue belts, but they were lucky enough. That's when um, Ernie Boggs had some jujitsu people around here. Yeah. So 
occasionally, like those guys kind of did sports jujitsu at the time and they did a little, then they were doing Brazilian jujitsu, so they would teach them. So I went to those seminars. So lucky enough to have that. But I mean, I paid 50 or $75 to train with a blue belt because that's how rare it was. There was none of them around. Oh, I, yeah. I paid a lot of money to go to a Pedro Car Carvalho. Oh, I remember him, belt. man. Like uh, I had his uh, World Combat, whatever VHS tapes that they used to make. Yes. Yeah. Actually, he was one of the ones that broke out and actually yeah. released some real shit they on VHS tapes. Yes. They were up till yeah. then, everything was pretty tame. And yeah. at that time, Pedro Carvalho, don't mean to go way, way back here, but Pedro Carvalho released real, you know, unorthodox at that time, Brazilian jiu-jitsu, which right now it seemed very tame, but it was not known to the world. And he let the cat out of the bag. Those are probably the best because there's multiple tapes of the vhs tape right like multiple like eight or nine right like it was a yeah. lot do you remember that gary i don't that might be for your time not so no uh, i would say about the time that i was coming around well we had kind of talked about this with dean lister but like dean lister was hot when i started jujitsu. Yeah. so we're talking 2000 that's 10, way 11, before 12. yeah it's way before i started doing jujitsu. now that being said i have like you know youtube it kind of finally hit and so a lot of that stuff was making its way to YouTube. And when I would do, because I like, as soon as I got into jujitsu, I got super nerdy about it and I wanted to know all that I could. And I was, I, I am guilty 100% of being a pirate and going online and finding anything and everything I could download. Cause I was just starving for knowledge. Well, to and, that point though, I was, I was not to interrupt, but the funny story was about those videos is the guy that made them. So so back when those came out, like everybody would trade tapes. Do you remember that, Ashley? Like, oh God, yes. Yeah, and so I was tapes online. Tapes of tapes of tapes. Like yeah. you might get a fourth generation tape. Exactly, and that's in quite. On, this all sounds stupid, but that's like when the internet was just coming out. So this is like '97. Like the internet was out, but you're on AOL dial-up, and it was just coming out. So like, I was so dumb to write like, "Hey, I've got these tapes. I'll trade you," like on a giant message board. Tape right? trading I, was a thing. Yeah, and I was dumb. And then, like, the guy that made the Pedro Carvalho tapes, I don't remember his name, but he wrote me. He's like, motherfucker, you're going to jail. I just called the FBI, and I was like, holy shit. Like, I'm, I'm done. Like, I was scared to death. I started burning fucking files and shit. I was, I was like, I'm going to take my computer and throw it in the, in the ocean. Or something. You know, like, I was scared. But it literally was the guy. Like, I don't remember his name, but I mean, it was the guy. Like, he was like, I'm the owner of this thing you're done motherfucker. And I was like, dude, I'm 17 or whatever I was. I was like, I'm just a kid. Like, I don't know. I didn't know the internet was a thing, you know, so oh, they leave me alone. <laughs> and, they, and they left me alone. Like he either was bluffing me or he, it was the real person a hundred percent. So that's the thing, but he either was like, like a cease and desist kind of thing, or he believed that I was, just, and I was a young kid. Or it might be a Brazilian bluff. But that's what i'm saying it Either worked way, he won it, he won because i got off those but everybody did it it was just i was dumb enough to post it worldwide you know what i mean i might oh, it happened it was a thing yeah i might have posted on the underground you know mma.tv or whatever it was called at the time like that's where we all went on the message i might have literally posted it on a thing that millions of people saw like i was that dumb you know but um but anyway yeah it was crazy and then it, then mario spare tapes came out but Anyway, sorry, Gary. I just wanted to say that like, that was no. crazy. Like the FBI, I thought the FBI was going to arrest me for doing jujitsu, like for for trying to train jujitsu, really for tape trading, which is not legal. You shouldn't do that, and I don't do that anymore because I don't. And have, you don't endorse that at all. I don't endorse it. Yes, yeah, so don't do that, kids. Luckily, yeah. No. Well, and that, and that is kind of like you know that, that's the nice thing. Uh, <laughs> we always yeah, every generation. The, the generation before will be like, hey, I had to travel uphill both ways in the snow. <laughs> exactly. Right? And, and so, like, I, I think about it. You guys had it worse than me, but I also have it worse than the kids that are doing it now because it's like, man, I like, if my, because I had a blue belt instructor, my blue belt instructor didn't know it, then I had to go to YouTube, and you guys can buy the whole John Donaher leg lock series, enter the system, and it's all there for you. None of that stuff was there. I had to go search for it on Google. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the other, you know, Ashley and I are so old that YouTube wasn't a thing. 
I used to post shit on Google video, which Google bought YouTube, but it was like, there was competing, there was no YouTube. And then when YouTube came out, nobody knew if it was going to be a thing, right? Like, that's how fucking old we are. Like, we, did, we couldn't even search YouTube. We had to get the goddamn VHS tapes, which is sad. But again, that's walking up school, you know. But I'll tell you school. what, Butch, I credit a lot of my understanding of things to having to carve shit out on my own. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. I, I, I'm going to dive here a minute. But when you have to figure shit out on your own, there's a whole different level of understanding. There's an entirely different level of conceptual understanding. When you have to take on a concept that you have no idea about, but figure it out on your own with a trial and error with, a, with partners, like I had Brian Dusenberry, I had you know, Gary Ansel, I had you know, a whole host of it, and, and Neil Hurl and, and John Oliverio, and I had a lot of people who I dove into positions with. And I'm particularly pleased with what I personally discovered about Half Guard before there was ever anything about Half Guard. No one knew shit about Half Guard. But I was like, I'm getting stuck in this fucking position where I've only got one leg. You know, do I have, you know, how do I deal with things with my arms? You know, my, my leg, I have control of one of his legs and I don't have control of one of his legs. Okay, so it's almost a half mount, you know, and then, you know, do I have an underhook? Do I have an overhook on the, the side of the leg that I have control of? Or do I have an underhook or an overhook on the other side? Anyway, I've got my analysis sheet where I did a matrix, basically, of analysis of these things. And what I ultimately came up with, ultimately being fundamentally sound on my own, you know, before anyone told me shit and that was really beneficial you know because then i and when things started coming out and people started saying oh yeah this this and this i was like yeah i already know that i know that because i figured that out on my own i already knew that concept because i figured and when i realized when i learned that i had learned how to learn when i learned how to teach myself when i taught myself how to teach myself that was fucking magical for me. That was a magical fucking moment because I knew I can figure problems out. And they're, you know, nine tenths right. Maybe not completely right. I may not have a hundred percent of this, but I can be 80% correct. That's it. No, if that's... I apply a, a, a system of analysis to it. And that's what I did. And when you're not spoon fed, moves when you're not spoon fed things there, there's a different level of understanding that comes with it and with that you know I, I i think that's difficult for me because it took a lot more time it took a lot more effort and and i know butch had to deal with that too yeah well so to get but, it, that's what i was gonna say it's good but at the same time you know we understand things better we learn things better but at the same time, it cost us time. It cost us efficiency because I've learned moves and I practice moves and I drilled moves and I drilled them wrong. Damn it, I drilled them wrong. Yeah. And then I, I got the memory and the muscle fucking wrong, all absolutely wrong. But with modifications, I was able to unlearn that. But I had to go through the process, learning it, learning that I learned it wrong, and then unlearning it and learning it correctly. And I, that is a very difficult, costly effort. And that's what I hope to be able to provide as a platform for my students. And I know you do too, Butch, and, and, and I'm certain you do too, Gary. But to my students, I want to offer you the benefit of my trial and error. And I want to help you as efficiently and effectively as, uh, along your journey as I possibly can. Um, I, I agree 100%. I think I, it kind of takes us full circle too, because all of those things that you had to do in order, like, like for you, it was half guard. For me, I got to a point where I was like, okay, what do I do from guard? Because you know, not that Helson Gracie Jiu Jitsu or Elio Gracie Jiu Jitsu is limited in being in someone's guard. There are definitely answers, but 
my basic jujitsu understanding, I was stuck and I had to kind of do the, whole, the, the same thing where it was like, where do I go now? Because everything that I have, the people who are at my level are better, they have a counter for. So I need something new. And that, I kind of started venturing off, started playing. I would get ideas from different places. I found Javier Lovato Jr.'s pressure passing system. And that was like life changing for me, changed my entire game as far as like being a top pressure passer, passing the guard. And, Is that what you are? I, I I like to envision myself now I'm old and slow. And so it's nicer that I can do pressure passing, but, but like, that's kind of what I envisioned myself. But, uh, but uh, it, I got to a point where it was like, I, I, I didn't feel like I was growing anymore. I need something new. And, and I think this, like I was saying, it comes back full circle. We all enter into these roadblocks in life. Right. And we don't necessarily have the immediate answer. And we're going to take a lot of bad turns and we may have learned a lot of things that were wrong along the way, but it was that perseverance and the dedication and the not giving up on the problem at hand. I could have easily just said, well, I guess that's jujitsu and this is, this is what happens. And it's just a stalemate. Now there is no passing this or I can go and I can seek out new answers. Not um, like you, like, hey, I'm getting stuck in half guard. What the hell do I do from here? This shit sucks. You could have said, this is just jujitsu, but you didn't. You, you studied it and you applied, you started to reason it, right? And you used the scientific method in it. And, and I think that's the beautiful thing about jujitsu is like, I've applied that to other things that I've done in life outside of jujitsu. And I don't sure. know that I, I don't know that I would have had the same dedication outside of life had it not meant life or death, you know, metaphorically, <laughs> metaphorically in jujitsu when we're sparring. But sure. I don't know that I don't know that I would have had the 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 same application in my everyday life that I would have had had it not been for jujitsu. Brilliant. That's, <clears throat> that's beautiful. And and to echo kind of to what, what you're saying, Ashley, too, like when we started, right, like I trained with Hoist, I could only see him once a year if I was lucky. And, and we talked about this before in that podcast that, you know, when he would show up, that's when he was switching to self-defense. So I'd wait all year and he'd show up and teach self-defense. And that's not exactly what I was into. Not that there's nothing wrong with that, right? But um, that's, that's not what, you know, it's not what I'm looking for. Although the self-defense seminars that I do teach, a lot of it is Gracie Jiu-Jitsu combined with Krav Maga, but a lot of it's is heavy in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. So I'm forever thankful for that. But to your point and to what you said, we had to figure stuff out on our own, right? You know, Gary is like, he had some health and stuff, right? Um, you got like, we, we all had some stuff. We all did. So, so I'm not saying, I'm not trying to compare us old guys to Gary and say that we had it worse because we all had it somewhat. But, the deal was is exactly what people say is you don't become good at a move until you have to teach it because then you have to figure it out. Right. It's like once we all know how to do an arm bar, but if I got to teach it to my student, now I have to understand the arm bar. Right. Is that, do you understand what I'm saying? Like, I have to understand like, okay, now when's the, where, where's the when and where's the why we all know the how I can go out on YouTube and learn the how, and it depends on the instructor on the YouTube video if he's showing me the when and the why. But that is the beautiful part. For example, um, you know, us with Marcelo Montiero, we, we have a curriculum. And some people will shit talk the curriculum because he never talks about the when and the why. He just shows the move, right? And he might talk a little bit, but he told me specifically that's why. He, because he, he's like a little old school. He's afraid that people would watch our curriculum and then know our game and blah, blah, you know, whatever. It's you know, as, as us in jujitsu, we may not feel that way because we think jujitsu, jujitsu, you need to go out and do it, right? He's a little old school and he's like, I don't want no people to know our techniques, right? I don't want, and so therefore he names things differently. He'll, instead of calling case of Tommy, he calls it like scissor side control, right? And the theory is that way, if I yell at Gary, hey, do scissor side control, like maybe your students don't know what he's saying, right? And I remember this very funny. That's a real thing. It is a funny, and, and I remember really because you mentioned Neil Neil Hurl Hurl, because I remember they were tenth planet for a while, and they were out at outside at the West Virginia games. They're tenth planet, so they're yelling baby wipe, you know, 
crackhead control, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so then uh, people from Mor Morgantown, just to make fun of him, he started yelling like, Whopper, Big Mac. <laughs> like all this random shit. Because he's like, this is so fucking ridiculous. Like, we all know what you're doing. It's a stack pass. It's not fucking, you know, whatever. You know, and he's, and it just, it, it made me laugh, right? Like, it's funny. And he wasn't making fun of Neil. I, I know, like, you know what I mean? Like, y'all come from the same place and, I, and whatever it is. It was like, it just is funny. Even if we're yelling scissor side control, like, also, that's kind of bad coaching, right? Like, I shouldn't yell to Gary if he's out there competing. You've got the arm bar because now he don't have the fucking arm bar. It's too late, right? I got to say it like, you know, if they use code, I'd say, hey, Gary, you know, it's there or, you know, just stuff, right? Like time well, and that's where the benefit of Portuguese is oh, that's for right. the yeah. for the Brazilian coaches because they can talk straight talk Portuguese and we don't have a clue what they're talking about. Yeah, and that's what Salo was doing at the tournament, right? He's yelling what we talked earlier, yelling all Portuguese, and people are getting pissed because they didn't know, but they was so adamant that they knew they're like, "Fuck that guy!" Whatever he's saying, fuck him. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know. I mean, when 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 you when you've got a, a a student who's someone's on their back and uh, the the opponent has their legs crossed, well, you know, obviously that invites the uh, figure four leg lock on the people that are crossing their legs on the back. It's a big yeah. no no. Well, when you say anything, crossed legs, crossed whatever, yes, they're gonna move instantly. It. Pop, they yeah. come off and they go right to where they should be. You know, and you know, it's a, it's a thing. Yeah. So, and, and I was and Tom DeBlas. I forget what exactly what he said, but it was a very good post one time. But it was more like he coach. He tells his students what the other guy's gonna do instead of telling his students what to do. Like, hey, do an arm bar. He's saying, hey, he's doing this. He's doing this. Blah blah blah. Which makes sense, right? Like that way, if they can get to understanding, like if he's a step ahead of the guy. That helps his student. He's right? calling that out to his his student. Hey, look, this is what he's looking for. He's looking for a yeah. cross joke. He's looking for a bow and arrow or something like that. Yeah, that makes sense. Makes it makes exact sense. Yeah, and and like and my point with with that whole thing was besides the the different terminology was that is our job is to learn the the why and the when and why we and really break it down and without the knowledge without being a teacher. I may never think of that, right? I didn't think of that until I became a teacher. And that is, the, that is and I, I mentioned it a lot of times when I'm teaching, I was like, you can go to YouTube and learn moves all the time, but you need to know why you're doing them and when you're doing them and, and the concept behind it. And this is, and the shortcuts that I take as a jujitsu practitioner is just concepts, right? Like, and Tom DeBlas for that matter, taught me a great concept that, that really I was embarrassed to, to just learn at this point in my career, but in the last probably five years, he was like, look, in order to sweep somebody, their head has to be above yours. And I was like, Jesus Christ, why did I never know that? Like, that really <laughs> <laughs> like literally, I just learned that, you know, and it changed everything because like when somebody had me in lockdown, for example, sometimes I, you know, their head was underneath mine and, and like I because I was just worried about my leg. And then maybe they would whip my leg up and get an electric chair or, you know, or a sweep or something. But but once he said that, then I really thought about the head position and then corrected myself and then started pressure passing like Gary likes to do. And like, I like to do, cause we're all big guys. And it changed a lot of things. It was a simple concept. And that's how I like to teach is just very simple concepts. Like I'll say, Hey, in general, this is what you need to know. It doesn't mean that it's a hundred percent of the time, but at least 90% of the time is, is if you follow this concept, you'll find your say your, your, your way out of a bad spot. Right. And right. I think that is the best thing as a teacher. Um, for me, right? Like, believe me, there's better. I've been listening to a lot of Donahue podcasts and Gordon Ryan podcasts, and I'm changing the way I teach because they they have a new way. I think I, I a little bit different than mine, at least. But and they're successful, um, so I'm changing things a little bit. But it's still like I've learned a lot of concepts from them, so I know it's this. They're on the same wavelength. They just have a different concept. Like one of the Donahue podcasts is I never have somebody do a hundred arm bars, for example, right? He was like, why would I do that? It's fucking stupid. And the, and the guy, Lex Freeman was interviewing him at that time. And he's like, what? He's like, that's what we do all the time. Like somebody said, do 50 arm bars. He said, when you do 50 arm bars, then all you're doing is counting to 50. You're not worrying about your arm bar technique. You're just going one, 
to you just wanting to get it over so that the you know the change is the counting he's like why would i do that like the what i'm worrying about is the arm bar we need to concentrate on the fucking arm bar not the number so we'll say do the arm bar and do it right until you're done and i was like you know what i mean like if you look at it like without thinking about it, it just seems like a statement. But if you really break it down, that makes a lot of sense because it's the little things. That's what people do. It's human nature. When you say to do fit, like, for example, I do cross, I did CrossFit and they would say do 50 deadlifts. So I did 50 deadlifts as fucking terrible as you can do them. Cause the other thing was to do them as fast as you can. So I literally, there was not a deadlift. I just picked the bar up 50 times, right? And I just got done for 50 times. But if somebody said do 50 deadlifts, and whatever, you know, then I would do 50 good deadlifts. But when they said do 50 and get them done as fast as you can, then I just- That changes the dynamic. Yeah, I did 50 half-ass deadlifts, right? And then then I applied that to Jesus. I was like, man, he is right. That is exactly what everybody does. And a lot of times I make fun of them. I don't correct them. I just said like, that's a terrible arm bar. What are you doing? You know, just make fun of it, right? And we move on. But but listening to that, which is the beauty of jujitsu, like, and we said earlier, as a black, I, I am still, I learn every day and I, and I can't shut that off because we can't, like, I'm nobody, right? Like the evolution is part of John Donaher and, and Gordon Ryan. They've changed the game, everything, not just leg locks. They changed, now Gordon Ryan got so good at leg locks, he decided not to do them. When's the last time you seen him do one? He don't do them because he was like, everybody said he does them. So now he's mounting people and triangle on them. And, and he has a back take DVD coming out. So he, he chokes everybody. So I was like, wait a minute. They just have a more efficient way of training and doing because he's murdering people, murdering them. Like, right? like so well, like, and then I, I was like, well, I'm not going to murder people, but maybe I can change the way I'm training and we can do something. Right. Sorry. Well, it's just creating and discovering the better way to do things. And that is a constant evolution that we brought up at the very beginning of this was there's a constant evolution. They are one or, or several cogs, if you will, ahead of the evolution. But you know what? At some point, they're going to be behind the evolution. At some point, you know, Don Her is going to be ancient. At some point, Ryan is going to be ancient history. You know, and those things are going to be history, but they are indelibly there. I mean, undeniably there. Gary? Gary? <laughs> no, I, I think that's a great way to wrap things important up. to say, Gary. No, I, I was, I, it was kind of, I was going to echo that is that. Yeah. I think that all of this is part of the evolution, right? And it's not going to stop growing. I think also going back to Butch saying, hey, they're going back. Oh, he's back attacking. Not to say that Gordon Ryan couldn't leg lock anyone he wants to. But yeah. the, the, further, the further along we get, the more people recognize that the legs are in danger. And I think that he is using, you know, the defense of the person to go back to basic jujitsu, which is kind of interesting because I've always thought this, as you have new things happen, almost ultimately it will regret, regress back to the basics. Because Isn't that the, beautiful? The basics- Isn't that, I've noticed the same thing. I swear to God, I've noticed the same thing and it eventually evolves back somewhere to the fundamentals realm. Yes. You know, it may, it may go to an outlier element but that outlier element will eventually swing back. And, and it's, I tell my guys this, I have these, you know, younger guys come in and they'll talk about Baron Bolos or, Hey, how do I do uh, this Imanari role where ah, I want to get into the leg locks. And I'm like, do you think that Gordon Ryan doesn't know how to shrimp from side control? <laughs> because I promise that anybody in here comes in, if Gordon Ryan was to come in, and they started inside control, he would be able to get back to guard. And if you can't do that, don't ask me about Imanari rolls and don't ask me about Baron Bolos because it really isn't that important. Exactly. Absolutely. No, and, and you, Ashley echoed it and so do I. We've noticed the same thing. Like when we're teaching new moves, then somebody will inevitably say, all those old moves that weren't working like last <laughs> week are working all of a sudden. <laughs> Like, because everybody's worried about the other stuff. 
and they're blocking it. So especially from De La Hiva, obviously that's kind of our thing. That's where we come from. So we'll do some new stuff. And then all of a sudden, all of the fundamental De La Hiva stuff will work because they're worried about the new crazy stuff. And they're like, what I've noticed is the stuff that I couldn't use last week's all of a sudden working. And I was like, that's the way it always goes. And that's usually going back to what you said, Gary, early too, is the cool thing about cross training and going to competition is sometimes you can't, you can't measure your level, right? Um, because you train with the same guys every day, they kind of know your game and they kind of stuff what you're doing, right? Like, for example, like when I roll with people too, and I, and I, and I tell them too, like some people are like, oh, you're man, you're really good. You know? And I'm like, literally, I know everything you're going to do. Like, yeah. you know, let's cut to the chase. Like, instead of blowing myself up and agreeing with you, like I've taught you since you're white belt, I know what your game is. So I can just shut it down before you start. And I say that because for two reasons, like to let them know, like, Hey, like, change it up a little bit, do something different. And, and just to be real. Right. And, th and that's the thing. Like we can shut each other down because we all know each other and we recognize patterns, but when you go to a tournament, you don't know anybody, you don't know anything of what they do. That's the, that's the beautiful test, right? Because it's going to take you a couple of minutes to figure it out. It is a sport, that's, you know, and again, not to, to always go back to that podcast, but that's why the grace is like the no time limit thing, because it's a different thing, right? We're in a sport. We're talking about five, 10 minutes. We only got so long to figure it out. And then you might not figure it out fast enough in that time. And I also, like, I was just telling our guys at the gym the other day, like, that's the other thing. Like when I noticed when I roll with a really good black belt, that's what they do. They throw things at you and they find the hole and then they attack the hole. Right. And I, all of us aren't, aren't great at everything. Like maybe I've got one spider guard pass and this guy's great at spider guard. Then he's going to crush me. Right. Or I'm not good at reverse daily heave. There's a million things and they find that. Or you avoid good. spider guard altogether. Knowing Absolutely. that he's good at spider guard, yes. you know, and then take him out of his element. You go into pressure passing, which is something that you're better at or, or something akin to that. And it's a lot easier if I know what they're into, right? But if you don't know and somebody just grabs you and you're in that, and it's a little bit, then I've got to deal with it, right? But it's like, and that's kind of the beautiful thing of jujitsu, right? Is that you can't pick and choose your opponent, right? So we have to get ready for everything. And that goes back to the original thing if we're going full circle, is that's the evolution. I don't want to run into something that I don't know. I want to at least have somewhat an answer, right? I'm guessing that nobody at my gym is going to be an expert. They're not going to be, phenomenal at something that i'm not knowing right like because if they are i'm going to learn it at some point but if i'm at least got a pass or two from everything and maybe not even a pass just like maybe i could shut something down right like just kneel down to my knees and stop a couple spider gourd you know whatever it is then that's something right and then ultimately that's all of jujitsu is that getting you to play my game right it is a game we play we play a game if you play my game and my game's better, I'm going to win. If I play your game, your game's better, you're going to win. And that's the beautiful thing is how do we get each other into that thing? How do we trick each other? How do we play chess? That's also why, going back to what Gary said at the beginning, I would argue I like gi jiu-jitsu better. They're both great, but the gi is so much more technical because it's a lot of, a lot of holds and grips and chokes and so much more to look for. I would also argue it's better for newer guys because you can slow the game down and they can learn more. Whereas in Nogi, you may be just slippery and you get out of this arm bar all the time, but you actually suck because you're really in an arm bar all the time, but you never learn the, the correct. You're really shitty at defending. You're just yeah. good at relying on slick. Yeah. You know? that, that was a big thing. Like when Marcelo, our Marcelo Montero was teaching guys, UFC fighters. He had Matt Mitrione, Chris Lytle, a bunch of other guys he made them wear the gi and they didn't want to, but he was like, look, you can get out an arm bar cause you're bigger and stronger or slippery. But if I grab your material and you don't get out, it's going to force you to learn how to not get in that arm bar, not just get out when you have to, right? Like when you, and then, cause you're eventually going to run into a guy that you're not going to get out of it. Right. And then it's too late. Right. And I agree with that. So for the guys that love no gi, I love it too. But there is a benefit for the nogi, like especially for learning. I think, right? Don't, I mean, I assume you guys agree because you're older, old school guys, and I love. Look, it's a faster paced game. I never knock it. I just there's there's benefits of why you should learn with the gi, and and even at the at the age that we we're saying older, I love it when I'm older because I don't have to go super fast. There's other reasons, but I love the thinking. As I get older, too, the thinking is what really just well, and the timing with the yeah. gi, you get timing. 
timing yeah. of execution, timing of release. You can release your opponent and your opponent can do what you want them to do at your beck and It's Absolutely. not up to them. It's up to you. You can release them. You can release holds. You get to control timing to an degree more with the gi. And that that is a far more technical way to approach grappling. And wouldn't you agree, like, we can just take it off and then we're in the no gi. So, and there's not much difference. The difference that we would be missing is the speed. I can learn speed a lot more than I can learn technique, right? That literally is- Oh, like, absolutely. And, and conditioning for younger and, people, yeah. uh, you know, that, that becomes an element. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm like you, I'm not knocking it, but let's just face it, that is a fleeting element. Yes. Yeah. Uh, that does not exist there when you get, you know, when you go past 30, 33, you're going to start to notice, I promise you, a decrease in your physical abilities. Absolutely. That's going to happen. And it's going to continue on an exponential scale. Uh, but not so much with a, uh, not so much with a gi, you know, a gi en enables a lot more of a intellectual element to it. It's the way I kind of think of it. And maybe that's wrong, but. No, it's right. But I, I would think somebody in no gi thinks we're calling them stupid and we're not. It, it's like, it, it's a total, because a lot of stuff they do is very, very technical. The leg lock game is very technical, but that being said, for another you know not to keep echoing the podcast there but like craig jones on joe rogan podcast they don't leg lock each other at all meaning in the donher gym because they said they all know him like so they can't leg it like he's like it's very rare that we catch each other in leg lock because we know the the escape it's it's the difference in leg locks is if you know them and i don't then it's night and day because then you're catching everybody two seconds right like it's a like bam 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 and it makes you think oh man let's no gi is fucking amazing like because you're doing all this it's like knowing jujitsu and the other guy doesn't gi or no gi that's that's essentially what the leg lock game is it's like throwing a, you know, enough. a purple belt with a white i think right because us older school guys some of people resisted leg lock game and so they look like dog shit right and it's it's a different kind of game but that all being said like there's an argument with gi and no gi i don't think there's an argument i think it's all jujitsu I think it's all beautiful. What I'm saying is what we're saying right now is that I can take it off and I can still roll with you if, if I know the no gi game, leg lock game, blah, blah, blah. If I just take it off and I know how to choke you now, I can't choke you, then I'm dead. It just like you're dead if you don't know how to block chokes, right? It's the same difference. Like you can take an MMA guy and choke the piss out of him all day because he don't know, maybe he don't know how to block chokes, right? So that's like a separate argument. It, it's a different thing. But I think at, what we're saying is if jujitsu is jujitsu, and then we add in all the beautiful things with the gi, it's a lot funner as an older age. It's a lot slower as an older age. We can do it longer as an older age. I have some great guys on my Instagram right now, Hakim Johnson and Mike Dias, and like those guys. Those guys are fucking amazing, but also they're amazing because they're way younger than me. <laughs> not that's not only reason they're young, they're amazing. It's like that's what they do. I'll give you five or ten minutes, just like I give my wife about two minutes. That's all I got in me. Right, like that's, that's, yeah. if they put on a gi, I got a little bit more. Like, like yes. if my wife just lays there, we don't do nothing. I got a little bit more energy, right? It's, yeah, it's a little bit different, but but anyway, yeah. So I'm saying there's no argument. That's that's a weird way to get there, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, he's gonna love well, this. Let, let me just chime in with the leg lock thing. I have a concern. And this is just a concern from experience. And that is, you know, the leg lock thing is comparatively new to this generation. I picked up the leg lock game early on. And when I say early on, I mean in the 90s. And, you know, I picked up heel hooks. I picked up Sambo. I started training with, of course, Lloyd Irvin, who was big into leg locks. And I discovered I was fucking myself up with leg locks. I mean, my knees were getting fucked up. Well, so, so your knees are fucked up to this day. Am I right? No, no. Actually, I was recognizing that I was fucking them up. 
Uh-huh. My knees are actually very good. I've had I've had a hip replacement and I've got a significant sold, shoulder injury right now. But you know, and of course, you know, you train long enough, you're going to get hurt. That is just the nature of the beast. You're going to take some dings along the way, and you just got to accept that as part of the journey. And there's lessons along that line as well. We can get into that another day. But I discovered early on from fooling around with heel hooks, you can fuck your knees up just fooling around with heel hooks. Mine's I mean, messed up to this day from the first Arnold. Somebody, uh, I don't remember his name, Sean. He was in the UFC, but he caught me in a heel hook. And I, I don't, my leg still almost spins around in a circle. No joke. I mean, people have seen it. It's, it's, I never got Well, it. I wonder, I wonder, yeah. Butch uh, uh, and Gary, if in the future, we're going to discover a generation of grapplers who have fucked up knees because they're just popping back to heel hooks all the fucking time. And even though you go back and you tap somebody and you get these, you know, a pressurized tap, you may be getting micro damage. You may be getting micro damage to your knee that accumulates time after time, after time, after time. And that's what I was feeling. That's what I was identifying early on and backed off of heel hooks. I was like, Whoa, I don't know what this heel hook business is, but I am starting to have real knee issues. And I've never had knee issues, never in my life. And even to this day, I backed off. Thank God enough to the point where I protect my knees at all costs but I recognize the danger of heel hooks and they go on hard they go on fast and they are destructive as shit and anybody who says differently doesn't know what the fuck they're talking about no, it's good. Uh, <laughs> well TJ Dillashaw from the last fight which I did not see but Chad Mendes mentioned on a, a podcast I was listening to today that uh, apparently he got his knee tore up in that last fight and and it's like you know they're full on adrenaline so they don't tap and and he in they showed the video and they're like oh yeah i didn't notice that but yeah his his knee is jacked up and how long is that going to last because literally my knee injury this heel hook was 1997 (laughs) that's permanent man i'm going with my uh my bed's permanent yeah it's not good and and kind of it's kind of funny he said that it goes back to 1997 because i was i just watched choke Again, you know, uh, there's a lot of talk about Hickson and his book Breathe coming out and all that. And so I went back and I watched Choke again. Uh, it was probably last week. And uh, in watching that, one of the matches in that uh, in that competition that they had over in Japan, uh, the small guy. Uh, that, Andrew? Yes. So yeah. he finished he finished one of his matches with a heel hook and this is 19, this is, uh, that was pre UFC, right? Or at least around the same time. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, yeah. It, it, and so like going back and looking at that, it's like, we think of heel hooks and the leg entanglement game as being something new, but it's been around for no. ever. Yeah. And that's what Hickson said on that podcast. Again, sorry to keep ruining it for you guys. I need to watch, I need to go listen to it because yeah, he, he, cause he would just, he was like, I've been doing that forever. Same thing. He said, I was doing knee locks and he said, Eric Paulson showed him and Eric Paulson learned it from Shudo, yeah. which right. was, and which was Yoji Andro and all those guys. But, but and John Donaher mentions the same thing. He said, I did not invent, invent that. He actually pulled up. There's a picture floating around the internet from ancient Greece with like a minotaur doing a heel hook on somebody. So they've been around, but what John Donaher said is he, he helped evolve the game of the leg entanglement, which means like the saddle position and the, and all that. So he's, he changed it. And, and Dean Lister mentioned that too. When he was in, he's like, look, I'm not doing anything weird. He's like, I was doing 50 50 before it's called 50 50 this stuff's been around but what i'm showing you is a system and and people didn't have that's why it was kind of a downside is a, like an mma if you went for a uh, heel hook you just went for a heel hook and then if you didn't get it you got your face pounded in they've evolved the situation to you could kind of move from position to position position i think that's the evolution of the game and it is more popular but that's what the donaher guys are doing is there and that's what also what dean lister said he showed us a straight footlock but he's he called it open guard control where he's like look we can go into 50 50 we can go into he called it 405 and all these other things but he's like you know we're doing an open 
open uh is it what he called it gary an open leg lock system compared to a closed leg lock system oh, yeah open system closed system yeah but uh, yeah so the the point is it's always been around i think what the the difference is is they're they're inventing a system right as opposed right. To if somebody had a and you guys may be better than this i get this question all the time what is the difference between japanese jiu-jitsu and brazilian jiu-jitsu it's a hard question right like because i'll say well they're essentially the same and it came from japanese jiu-jitsu but the difference is, I, and, I, and I kind of explain it in that way. I just say they go for an arm bar, and if they lose the arm bar, they're done. Where we go for an arm bar to a triangle, to an omoplata, to blah, 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 blah. You know, right? Like, but they don't drill the same way we do. They're like, here's a throw to an arm bar, and then you're done. Like, I think that's the difference. I don't know. You guys might have a better answer, but I get that answer a lot. And, and usually I just answer it. I said, well, their black belts are maybe like a blue belt here, and I'm not knocking them because I'm a, a Japanese jiu-jitsu black belt as well. I, I was like, I'm trying to make sure I don't knock them. It's just, it's a different thing, right? Do you have a better answer to that? I guess since I'm on that, but it's essentially the same. I think it's just, they don't flow from move to move. And that is what leg lock system is. Maybe they're not flowing like we flow. Um, anyway, whatever you guys think, what do you think about that? Gary? <laughs> I, 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 well, I think it all just comes back to evolution. Is Japanese jiu-jitsu different than Brazilian jiu-jitsu different from uh, Keenan Cornelius's American Jiu Jitsu, is it different, or is Maybe. it just is it just evolving? Yeah, and I I, I really I really argue, think. Can you argue I, that what Elio Elio Gracie's Jiu Jitsu is different than Carlos Gracie's Jiu Jitsu? Then it's different than Maeda's Jiu Jitsu. You know what I mean? Like it did, obviously did, yeah. is right. Like I think yeah, different. you can, but it's you know it's got its marginal differences, much in the same way. You know, a, a, every swing of this pendulum has taken, you know, and it that's well, part of the intrigue of the whole thing. <laughs> well, I mean, Henry Ford came up with the Model T, right? And and functionally in, in the system, how different is that from uh, a, a, a Formula One race car, right? It's... it's uh, when you boil it down, it's the same thing. It's just yeah. the small evolutions between generations have made it a little bit better every time. But would you argue, that's a great argument. That's actually a great metaphor, Gary. But so would you say a Tesla is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu out of all that? Because it's completely different. It's completely different in the sense that uh, the, the engine is different, but now we're still, and all we've done is we've, We've changed the engine, which I mean, a Tesla could be the leg lock system, right? Yeah. So the Tesla is the leg lock system, but all of the standard principles are there. You have four Tesla. wheels, you have four wheels, you have, you have to worry about your center of gravity, you have to worry about your ability to break, you have to worry about your ability to, to accelerate and, and control under all of those different elements. And then on top of that, your, your tires still have to be inflated to the proper in inflation. Your, your uh, driver still has to be skilled enough to be able to operate under rain or snow or dry. You're very uh, smart, man. I thought I had you stumped right there. You're very good. You're very, very <laughs> intelligent, Gary. And, Beautiful. And, and, and so I think, I think all of it, I think it is just, I think the principles underlying all of it are still the same. I, I, not to say that Elio didn't change everything. He did, but you know, I, I think, uh, I think Henry Ford did the same thing when he came up with the production line as, as, as a way of manufacturing, all of these things are, are, everything is evolving and we're always moving forward. And uh, though we move forward, I still think we rely on, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before is that coming back to the basics as long as the fundamentals are sound, we can improve on those fundamentals and the change around them and how, how, we, how we use those fundamentals. But if the fundamentals aren't solid, then, then the whole base doesn't have a structure to stand on. Makes Fair sense. enough. No, it's a beautiful answer. Wouldn't you agree, Ashley? Uh, that is spot on. <laughs> Absolutely spot on. <laughs> Good analysis. Because I thought I was super intelligent with my uh, my comeback there, and Gary just crushed it. So I was like, "Damn, he's awesome. That's freaking." Well, that's good, man. Well, 
here's what I think. That was a beautiful answer. We're we're about at three hours. You guys have anything else to? Holy cow! Are we really? Yeah, probably at two and a half. But we've we've kicked. I, I will also say, one of our better podcasts. When you say Gary, this and the absolutely. Yeah. But, well, the conversation. I, here's here's I think really what it comes down to is you got three guys who really really love jujitsu and don't plan on going. Not that anyone else that has been on here. But we also have kind of a similar background. And it's easy to talk about it when we all share the same love. Yeah. Right. And and, and the same baseline love, like uh, of that that just pure jujitsu for the love of jujitsu. Um, I think it comes out. I know it comes out when Ashley's speaking about it. And every conversation that I've had with Butch has, has been the same way. It's like I love all of jujitsu for jujitsu, and and I don't judge it for you know. For anything I, I love it for what it is well Ashley once you finish us off with something very very profound like you're giving a closing statement <laughs> <laughs> ladies and gentlemen of the jury yeah. how's that now that I have your spot? attention <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I'm gonna put you on full view on my Instagram here we go all right you've got the well full- let me just offer this guys this has been an absolutely wonderful conversation. I, it has been enlightening and delightful to engage in. I appreciate being a part of this. Uh, and anytime, uh, if you need to, if you need someone, give me a call. I would love it. And I know that my partner, Tim Dunlap, would love to fill in as well. But that said, what we do, and I would offer this to each of you and anyone that's listening, at our school, we offer a free seminar twice a year, absolutely 100% free, twice a year, once in the winter, once in the summer, typically to break up doldrums of some sort. Uh, it's not at a fixed date one way or another, but it is offered twice a year, and it is absolutely 100% free to anyone that wants to attend, and it is a seminar that's offered by and extended to anyone in the West Virginia or regional area, Uh, any school of any affiliation, please come to our school. Please come, please bring your students, please bring your instructors. It is exceptionally friendly, exceptionally light, exceptionally fun. And the format is this, we have our we line up our black belts, all the black belts from any school that visits, anywhere. And basically the format is this, it's free to all students and it's generally tailored toward white to blue level techniques. And we ask the black belts from any instruct, any school of, uh, of any nature to teach one move, just teach one move. And it might take 10 or 15 minutes of drilling. And then we move on to another black belt that teaches another signature move of theirs or something that they think would be a benefit. And anyway, we we encourage everybody to uh, participate in the whole idea being, and then then we have open sparring just to develop. And the whole idea behind this whole thing is to develop a camaraderie among the West Virginia and regional jujitsu community. It's not designed for money. Clearly, we're not making a dime at all uh, uh, about it, but we've done that for years. And I encourage you guys and anyone that's listening, please attend, join the the local community and participate and you'll be surprised at the friends you make and we we do it in only the the most positive of lights uh there's nothing hostile or negative about it it's mainly just a celebration of this art that we love and this art that has benefited us all and we hope to help others grow and further entrench themselves in this art that has developed us in we hope to enlighten others. Well, th- thank you. And, and that was beautiful. 
we couldn't end on a better note. I want to finish with thank you for everything that you've done for the entire jujitsu community. I've know I've I've mentioned West Virginia a lot, but the entire community because you guys in 1994, that's the beginning of jujitsu. Jiu-Jitsu effectively started in 1993 and the UFC came out. However, we had nowhere to train. So for those badasses that went in the backyard and trained, even when their dads were telling them that they were looking a little weird, you know, but you persevered and, and moved forward. And now you've, you've created something special um, and you continue to grow and, and, and make better people. And uh, you know, really I can't say enough that uh, you've inspired me to do great things just by being somebody else in West Virginia. We've, I've always said this privately and I'll say it publicly now that you're on here. We, you know, I have a rivalry with you because I want to be better, a friendly rivalry. It doesn't mean that I'm trying to make Absolutely you- Absolutely it is. Yeah, and same for you and, and, and same with everybody I talk to. We make each other better. Um, without you, I wouldn't be who I am. Without Gary, I wouldn't be who I am. So without each other, without these friendships, we can't be better people. So thank you for everything. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for making better people. Thank you for just being you. So thank you. Thanks for this awesome podcast too, by the way. This Hopefully uh, this will inspire people to do jiu-jitsu with all of us. Well, thanks for having me on. Uh, right. I appreciate it, Gary, Butch. Gary. Thank, thank, thank you, Ashley. Butch, thank you. All right, thank you guys. Have a good night. I appreciate it. Good night, guys. Bye.